de la Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, Campus Lerma, quien va a iniciar la presentación y luego yo voy a decir algunas, algunas palabras y con eso eh, iniciaríamos la, el evento. Hello, uh, I'm, we are very glad to have you here. Uh, finally, after two years of uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, 2019, it was terrible because we were working at home and this is the first year we are uh, relaunching this nice uh, conference. Uh, well, uh, as you can see, we have some uh, historical perspective that, that uh, we want to show you. We started this, this conference in 2015. We have this uh, nice crowd here of very talent, talented people, just students and professors. Uh, we were very excited in organizing this uh, conference. Uh, we thought that this will be a very nice opportunity in order to uh, find some collaborations between internationals and, and Mexican institutions. So this still is our idea to have this uh, nice collaboration and in also show some uh, frontiers in the interface in, in, in bi biological and, and physics, no? Uh, I think this is a way to, to uh, improve our perspective from a global view. Uh, that means that uh, the way in which, in which we want to interact is including people from Europe, Asia, uh, North America, Latin America, I think, uh, maybe it's because it's, well, the next one, please, la siguiente. Then, uh, 2017, we have this uh, same conference, but in, at the UNAM, in the C3. C3, a uh, very nice uh, room where we, we had this nice conference again, two years la later, then, Next one, please, la siguiente. Eh, in Uh, talks. Very. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Eduardo. So I'm going to uh, just move forward with a brief statements and greetings to everyone. I'm going to say this in English first, and then I'm going to move to Spanish. I just um, just to promote both official languages of this conference, which is English in the first place and then Spanish. So thank you very much, Eduardo, for this uh, wonderful reminder. And as he told us, actually, this conference started in 2015, uh, when a group of, at that time, young colleagues and friends, which is Eduardo, Orlando Guzman, and Osvaldo Resendiz, and, and myself, decided that it was a good time to start uh, biophysics conference to bring together scientists in physics, math, biology, molecular biology, and computational sciences, chemistry, of course, etc. So at that time, we were 
were more thriving and, and young and decided to start this, this adventure, which actually, let me tell you that it was actually an adventure because at that time we did this conference in three days and in three different locations all over spread Mexico City, which was an adventure. All that you know, Mexico City is a huge city, so to move from one place to another was actually quite an adventure. We were from Universidad Autónoma de la Ciudad de México, OASM from where I belong, which is in the north, to the south, to the, to the center of the city, etc. But it was very nice. Then, 2017, we were at UNAM, at Centro de Ciencias de la Complejidad, which I, which I, I am a, a joint professor at, at Center of Complexity Science at UNAM as well. And then, in 2019, we did the conference as well in UNAM, at C3, I think. And now we're here in this wonderful building, which is, uh, which is uh, un Casa del Tiempo from Guam, uh, which is a, a very, very historic and nice, nice building. So we are uh, very, very excited to gather again and um, to have this opportunity to all meet again in, in, in person. Uh, as we all know, in this, the previous two years were very difficult for different reasons. In, in any case, we tried to to start, uh, to continue working, to continue doing research in all our houses most of the time. But now this is a great opportunity to again gather and enjoy this conference. So thank you very much, especially to all our friends and guests and professors that come from abroad, uh, which is, have made a long way to be with us today. Thank you very much to all and uh, enjoy the session posters as well, which is gonna be held uh, to, uh, today at seven at six p.m. I guess, yes. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to very briefly move to Spanish to make some acknowledgments. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. And muchas gracias a todas las a todas las instituciones que participaron. La Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, desde luego, la Universidad Autónoma de la Ciudad de México, en la cual pertenezco, eh, el Instituto de Ciencias Físicas de la UNAM, con el doctor Carlos Muñoz, que desafortunadamente no pudo estar el día de hoy aquí por diversas razones pero también es parte del comité organizador, al staff que nos ha ayudado del Instituto de Ciencias Físicas de la UNAM, al staff también agradecemos de la, de la UAM todo el apoyo que nos están brindando, muchísimas gracias. Y, um, and I think that that's all. Thank you, thank you very much and enjoy this conference. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, I think it's 9.30 also, uh, almost. So we, we can uh, introduce Ioan Enriquio. He's coming from the University of California, Irvine. And he is a professor there. And he's going to talk about very nice methods to improve the sampling in molecular dynamics uh, simulations. So, uh, Thank you, um, Eduardo, for inviting me. Thank you, Luis, for organizing and taking care of um, all the details of this exciting conference. Um, I will, um, I'm coming from the University of California, Irvine. Irvine is one of the 10 campuses of the University of California system. And I am uh, working in the area of uh, computational molecular biophysics. We are using computer simulations at the level of atoms and at the level of the continuum to address uh, topics that have to do primarily with uh, proteins, uh, nucleic acids, and the interactions between proteins and nucleic acids. And today I'm going to um, talk uh, about two aspects of this um, overall, uh, uh, overall area. Um, at the beginning I will um, introduce a little bit the theory that we use um, to look at these systems from a computational point of view. And, um, Secondly, I will walk you through a zoo of various beasts that we have uh, simulated, various proteins and uh, nucleic acids and nucleoprotein complexes, uh, using, simulated using the uh, theoretical techniques that I will uh, present at the beginning. Okay, so 
um, there are two problems in um, simulating biological molecules. The first one is the problem of time, and the second is the problem of spatial scale. The problem of time comes from um, the fact that um, uh, it comes from the fact that we use um, integration of Newtonian dynamics. So we advance discreetly with time steps that take one femtosecond. Um, whereas biological processes, as you know, occur on uh, time scales. You know, the exciting biology occurs on time scales of microseconds to milliseconds if not seconds, okay? So there's a, there's a huge gap in the time scale that we can simulate directly. We can reach microseconds, but uh, beyond that, milliseconds and seconds, we have to make approximations to the uh, exact integration of the equations of motion and come up with, um, uh, with, with ways to calculate um, uh, these, um, these processes. Okay, so the second, um, sorry, uh, the second um, is supposed to show something, but not on the, on the TV. Okay, so the, the second problem um, has to do with um, the large scale of the uh, of the of the problem the large scale of the problem in which um, uh, the dimension of the of the molecule is so large that it cannot be simulated directly at the atomic level so we have to use coarse graining we have to put several atoms together and make them act as a, as a, you know, a, a center of mass that interacts with other center of mass that are cross-grained, or we have to go to the continuum level. Okay, uh, all, both these problems, both these problems are um, due to the complicated, uh, to the complicated potential energy landscape. Okay, so, I have a biological molecule. It has a conformational space that's multidimensional, and um, the potential energy um, for any of these conformations is um, illustrated by a very rugged potential energy landscape in which you have uh, minima and maxima, and you have barriers that are um, distributed uh, over large um, energy scale. So you have the barriers that are much lower than KBT, than the thermal energy, but you also have barriers that are much larger. So this renders the simulation of how the conformational point moves in phase space, um, it, it, um, it breaks ergodicity, if you want. So the, the time average that you calculate is not equal to the ensemble average that you wish to calculate. So then, um, there are two aspects that need to be um, addressed in order to accelerate, to enhance the sampling of the conformations of your biological molecule. And uh, in the realm of thermodynamics, which is devoid of time, right? You just want to generate the Boltzmann distribution, and you don't care how you generate it. You don't need to follow the exact temporal evolution. So what you can do, if the potential energy is your problem, you can smooth it. You can transform the potential energy to another potential energy that doesn't have the barriers as large, uh, but preserves the location of the minima and the maxima, okay? And then you sample on the smooth version of the potential, which is incorrect. The potential is incorrect, but it is, expedi it is expediently, um, uh, it, it, it is uh, going to go faster than on the original landscape. 
It is computationally expedient, let's say. Okay, but after you sample, right, you get a distribution of points. It's a Boltzmann distribution, but it's wrong because the probability of that distribution is related to the incorrect potential. So what you're doing then is you take each point x that you sampled, you measure the value of the observable that you want to average thermodynamically, and you divide by the wrong weight, after which you multiply by the correct weight. So you do what's called reweighting. And you can show that in the convergence limit, don't want to say in the infinite limit, um, this is an exact equal. What does it mean? You can calculate thermodynamical averages on the correct but difficult potential by sampling the incorrect potential that's fast and then by reweighting it. And this is just a long introduction to a technique that those of you who are in the field know as umbrella sampling. Recently, metadynamics is of the same flavor, uh, parallel uh, tempering, replica exchange are similar in nature, just that they're, instead of fiddling with the potential, you fiddle with beta, that is with the temperature. You run at a higher temperature and then you reweight to get the correct answer at the lower temperature of physiologically interest, let's say. After all this uh, introduction, I want to say we don't, we don't do this uh, as a development method in theory. What we're interested in is the realm of kinetics. So we want to calculate what are the central quantities in kinetics. The central quantities are these time correlation functions. They play the same role that the partition function plays in the realm of thermodynamics. So we want to calculate uh, also an ensemble average, but we need to understand the temporal evolution. How does relaxation occur? Yes, and if we calculate these times correlation functions, we basically get everything in terms of the kinetics of the system. We get, say, the rate of folding, or we can, if we look at uh, multi-time point correlation functions, we can look at two-dimensional spectroscopies, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, the strategy that I explained doesn't apply to kinetics because if you sample the wrong potential, you may be able to reweight for the Boltzmann distribution, but the succession of events is too fast, so you get a relaxation that's too fast, and that's wrong. So what we do is to... Um, um, to, to do, what we do is the following. We generate incorrect trajectories but fast on the incorrect potential. And those trajectories now, not points, but trajectories. So this is a space-time quantity. These trajectories, these spaghetti noodles in phase space, have a weight. So if we are going to divide the weight of a fast trajectory, sorry, if we, if we are going to divide by the weight of, a, of the fast trajectory, and then somehow figure out what that fast trajectory would have had as a weight on the original potential, right? Because the trajectory is just a succession of points in time. So it could have occurred on the original potential, but with a lower probability. So if we know these, functional probabilities. Why do I say functional? Because the probabilities are a function of the function. Which function? Are a function of the trajectory. Okay, so if we do that, then we have a similar framework. Generate uh, fast spaghetti noodles, divide by the wrong weight, multiply by the correct weight, and in the infinite limit, well, infinite number of trajectories. I mean, in the, in the when you have many, many trajectories, then you can calculate the correct relaxation even if you uh, did it incorrectly um, but fast. Okay. So, um, I, I, um, I don't want to uh, go very deeply into the theory of this, 
but I just want to uh, explain how we calculate the weight of a trajectory, right? Because this is the essential point. Yeah, how, how do we calculate the weight of a trajectory? Um, we assume that we have a Langevin equation. This x here is the 3n dimensional configuration vector of the molecule. Say I have a protein, right? It has n atoms. This is a 3n dimensional vector. And the protein moves in a, in a mean field, in an effective field, um, according to the Langevin equation. So it's basically Newtonian dynamics plus a random force from the, say, water in which it is baited, but not, not present in the simulation. So this is the random um, force. Uh, don't worry about this term. The theory uh, we have developed it also to explain single molecule experiments, where in addition to single molecule pooling experiments, where you take each protein and you uh, pull it by its ends to understand its unfolding dynamics in the hope that then you will be able to back calculate its folding dynamics. So there you have uh, not only the forces on the atoms from the interactions between the atoms, but you also have external forces. So, so it's applicable there as well, right? But you have a friction term, you have the force between the atoms, and then you have a random uh, term, random force, and you have uh, fluctuation dissipation that relates the magnitude of the friction with the magnitude of the random noise, and this is the Langevin equation, okay? And uh, the weight of a Langevin trajectory is calculated as follows. Let's say that I want to uh, get out of the room. I, I am going to execute a uh, Langevin trajectory, so I'm going to take a step here and a step there and there and there and there, right? So I'm then asking, oh, but I could have gone through that door and, to, uh, you know, to the outside via another trajectory. Each of these trajectories have weights, have probabilities. How probable was that if I try all the, you know, samples, how probable is this, you know, path that's that's open. This is probably going to be the most probable path, right? And so what is its weight? Well, why did I go on this path and not on the others? Well, because uh, from all the steps that I could have taken, I choose to take one step from, a, let's say, Gaussian distribution. So the probability of one step is uh, going to be uh, the exponential so, and why did I go there? Because I chose this value of the noise and not other. So it's going to be e to the minus xi squared for the first step. And then for the second step, it's going to be again e to the minus xi squared. And again and again, so I have e to the minus xi1 squared times e to the minus xi2 squared times e to the minus xi3 squared. And when I... Um, uh, put everything together, I'm going to have e to the minus the sum of all the xi's squared, the sum of the square of the noise, or in the continuum limit, the integral. But the noise is related to everything else, to force, to friction, to acceleration, perhaps. And so that we know from the trajectory, and we put everything together that square of the noise is this integral, yeah? and now we have a path integral. This, uh, this is called an action. It's not the mechanical action that you're familiar with in classical mechanics. It's a stochastic action. It's called the onsager maklu action. And for trajectories, and here I'm going to stop, for trajectories, it plays the role of a potential. The weight of a point is e to the minus some potential over kBT. The weight of a trajectory function is e to the minus this functional over some normalization factor. Okay, so now we can do exactly what people do in thermodynamics. That is an important sampling, not of points, as in umbrella sampling, but of trajectory. So that's, that's the, the theory that enables us 
to calculate relaxation of systems that occur on milliseconds and seconds from trajectories that are microseconds. Right? By, this is how we can dilate time. Mind you, we do not generate the exact dynamics. So we, do, we do not have the, an individual trajectory that is correct on the millisecond to second time scale. But after we average all the incorrect trajectories, we do get the correct relaxation. Okay, so that's what I want to leave you with in terms of the theory for long time dynamics. And now very, very briefly, I'm going to explain what we do. I have 15 minutes, I think, or I can, I can go on, okay. Okay, so now um, I'm going to skip over a bunch of things and uh, tell you about how we um, deal with the, the spatial uh, problem, right? Let, let's say that you want to uh, simulate DNA. DNA in cells is long of the order of meters. Okay, so if you just, uh, in, in computer simulations, you can simulate, I don't know, say a million atoms, but that certainly is going to give you only, you know, a, a length of, say, several nanometers, yeah? So the problem is, and, and it would be okay, because proteins bind to DNA only over, you know, a few nanometers, so that, that would be fine. However, DNA um, also, does um, things like this. It does things like this. It's super coils, okay? And, and those super coils are um, on a, a length scale that cannot be simulated even on the million atom scale, okay? So how do we deal with it? Um, the simplest approximation is to assume that DNA is an elastic rod, a rubber rod, like, you know, elastic like this one. And um, that elastic rod is characterized by Kirchhoff's elasticity theory, where you go along the, um, the axis of the DNA and you calculate at each point S along the axis, you calculate how difficult is it for you to bend and twist the DNA. Okay, and that you incorporate in this three by three um, matrix that tells you the stiffness of the DNA. Okay, and these are just the, the, the tangent vectors at the point where you calculate the stiffness to bending and, and torsions. How do you get this? You get this vector, sorry, you get the matrix of stiffness by looking at a piece of DNA, several uh, base pairs around that point, in which you simulate them at the atomic scale. And you use fluctuation dissipation, right? The way in which uh, the DNA is going to relax uh, from twisted conformations on the uh, non-equilibrium, uh, in a non-equilibrium situation, right? From very twisted to extended, is according to fluctuation dissipation, the same way in which the, when at equilibrium, it's the same way in which the DNA fluctuates. So those atomic fluctuations over uh, some finite length scale are used to calculate the value of the matrix and then um, one is able to calculate the entire energy of the elastic continuum um, uh, in this way. Now if you have the energy, you have the equivalent equations to the Newton equation, right? So if, you, if at the atomic level you have the potential energy, take the gradient, you get the forces, and you do dynamics. And here are the equivalent uh, equations for the dynamics of these 
of this rod. There are two because we have, you know, what, what is, uh, you can think that Newtonian equation is coming from the conservation of linear momentum. So we have conservation of linear momentum and the angular momentum plus external forces. Okay, so now that we have uh, the equations of motion, we integrate them and we can look at a variety of um, biological systems that now I will uh, start to, uh, to, to highlight. One particular uh, problem that has to do with um, DNA at the large scale is to answer the problem of um, how does DNA fit into the capsid of bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that kill bacteria. And they have a rigid um, capsid, rigid capsule, and DNA is somehow pushed inside and packed, uh, sitting at a pressure that is 10 times the pressure in a champagne bottle. So it is highly pressurized, and when the time comes, something happens here at this outlet, and DNA spurts out and infects the cell and so on and so forth. It affects the bacterium and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So in this larger context, uh, there, uh, uh, in this larger context, uh, Tim Baker at, uh, at uh, UC San Diego, when uh, they looked with cryo-EM um, at the structure of how DNA gets out uh, of the capsid to infect the cell. They saw a very interesting, unexpected twist in the DNA. Yeah, so DNA seems to come out by making a very, very tight turn, something that looks like a donut, although it's not, you know, it's not, it's not continuous onto itself, it's just uh, a very tight turn and then it continues through the tube of the bacteriophage, through its tail, as it's called. Okay, so the, uh, what's the problem? Why, uh, we, you know, we know that DNA can make mini circles, so what's the problem? The problem is that the radius of this mini circle is smaller, it's much smaller than the smallest radius of any mini circle that you can make. If I would want to make a mini circle of this radius in solution, it w the DNA would simply melt because I would twist it too much. Okay, so the question was, what are they seeing in cryo-EM? Is this real? Is, this, uh, is the DNA still uh, base paired here? Or, or uh, what uh, uh, happens? So, what did we do? With our elastic rod model, and with the uh, structure of the uh, tube, right? The, the tube has a hollow um, a cavity, and we know the structure of that cavity, so we use the boundary as boundary conditions for a simulation in which we take the uh, elastic rod and push it through that cavity, as, as the, the, the bacteriophage would do with the real DNA. Yeah, so this is uh, the cavity we start, uh, we, we um, fix the DNA here at the end and we push the model to uh, go inside this uh, our glass figure, right? And so the more you push, the more you're able to fit in. Um, here these numbers represent how many base pairs you have in the hollow structure. Here we have 25 base pairs of DNA. Here we have 15. Here we don't, we don't have <laughs> any. We have one. Okay? Uh, so we're numbering what is curved, uh, how much DNA that is curved we have. Okay, so after we do this, right, it takes various forces and the DNA has a variety of energies in all these base pairs, as you can expect, right? This is uh, probably higher energy than this, and so on. And what do we do then? Then we take each of these um, structures. What are, what are the structures? It's a, 
you know, too much to call them a structure. They, they are just a line, right? They are just a curved line in space, the, 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 the axis of the DNA. So onto that axis, we put perpendicular base pairs, and we can then back and the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA, and we can reconstruct the atomic structure of the DNA that would be here, or here, or here, or here. Now that we have the atomic structure, remember, we want to answer questions that came from cryo-EM. Cryo-EM is a structural method that tells you where uh, things are according to the density of the atoms that are being observed. Now, but now we have the atoms, so we can ourselves back calculate what would a cryo-EM picture look like for, um, not for one, but for all of these structures, right? And you can calculate the energies that I told you about, and you can also calculate the all atom energies after you uh, reconstruct the atoms. And here are the back calculated, uh, these are computational cryo -EMs. So these are cryo -EMs. These are virtual cryo -EM pictures. This is what you would observe if you had the simulated, the computed structure of atoms. For um, all these numbers of base pairs in, curved in the cavity. Okay, so then what we do is we, co we compare with the experimental data. This is experiment. This is also experiment. AV are experimental pictures. This is an average of the of these. Yeah, so we do a linear combination with weights of these and we ask what combination of these gives me the best fit to the experimental data. And by doing that, you're addressing in the real system, what do you have? Do you only have one structure that's always there? Or, as it turned out to be, you have an ensemble of structures that coexist, and their average is what the cryo -EM is measuring. Okay, so this is one uh, thing you can do with the elastic continuum. You can then also do the dynamics of ejection. How does the DNA come out? And, you know, look, look at that. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's an illustration of using elastic rod theory. Another illustration uh, of that has to do with the activity of enzymes called topoisomerases. Yeah, so this is a movie from uh, Ninke Decker at Delft University, an experimentalist who, I forgot that this is a PDF, so it won't play. Um, so um, what, uh, you, what you have in, um, in that study is, I don't know if you can see, you take DNA and you twist its ends, it's going to... Uh, fold onto itself. So DNA is already coiled, right? DNA is a helical axis, but by twisting its ends, you're going to produce a supercoil. Yeah? And the problem uh, is that supercoil DNA cannot replicate. So you have to have enzymes that come in, bind to the DNA, and somehow get rid of these supercoils. Okay? In the absence of a movie, let's do a thought experiment. Um, let's say you take two rubber bands, two long rubber bands, put them next to each other, and you twist them a little bit. What are you going to do? You're going to produce a double helix. Okay? If you start twisting more, uh, the double helix will coil itself. So you'll get a super coil. You have, you'll have the coil of the double helix plus the big mess that you produce by super coiling the coil. And now to get rid of this, imagine that you come with scissors and you nick, you cut just one of the two DNAs, just one of the two uh, elastic bands. 
what is going to happen? The, at the cut, the, the cut band will rotate around itself and you're going to get rid of the super coil. Okay? And that's exactly what this kind of top isomerase does. It binds to the double uh, stranded DNA. It cuts one of its strands and that cut strand rotates around the intact strand and uh, supercoil DNA at, at micrometer distances is going to be relaxed. Okay, so um, in the experiment, before I talk about the simulation, I'm going to tell you what the experiment uh, can do. The experiment attaches, you know, attaches DNA, fixes it at a surface, and then at the other end, it attaches a magnetic bead. The magnetic bead has a magnetic moment, so not only you can, with micromagnets, not only that you can pull the bead, but you can also twist it. So they, they, they twist the DNA until the supercoils are produced, yes? Um, after which, this is one line, but it's actually a double strand, you understand, yes? And then the top isomerases bind, they cut one of the strands, the DNA is going to relax, so the bead will, uh, will you'll feel a, a jolt up in the bead, which will uh, signal the relaxation of one supercoil. The number of jolts of the bead up as you pull it taut is going to equal the number of rotations of the DNA, which is going to be equal to the number of supercoils that are relaxed. So you have at the single molecule level, right, this is not an ensemble, this is a single molecule level, uh, calculation of the rate from the experiment via microscopic manipulations. So what do we do? What we do, <clears throat> this is work uh, initiated by uh, my graduate student, uh, Jeff Vereshinsky, who is now uh, an associate professor at uh, uh, Chicago. Um, what we do is to simulate, we cannot simulate the supercoil at the atomic level, we use elastic continuum, we produce the supercoils ourselves by twisting our elastic model, and then we cut it at one end, and that end will feel, will feel a potential of mean force, it's actually a potential of mean torque, because it rotates, um, that comes from a very elaborate atomistic calculation. So what do I mean? I mean that um, there is, um, I mean that there is a structure of the protein bound to newly cut DNA that's crystallographically fixed in place so you can actually see that intermediate. Uh, I don't have it here, but, um, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. But um, the structure of this uh, blob is actually known at the atomic level. So we can calculate the atomic structure in the of the protein in the presence of DNA, move it around, twist the DNA inside the protein, and calculate the free energy at each angle. So you have energy as a function of angle, right? What is the derivative of energy with respect to the angle? It's the torque that the DNA feels as it rotates to relax for coils. It feels in the grip of the protein. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the meaning of this energy as a function of the angle. Yeah, so the derivative of this is going to be the torque that this end feels, and the rest doesn't feel a torque from the protein, but it does feel the elastic uh, force field that is used to describe it. So this, then, we can integrate. I showed you the equations for the elastic continuum model, and we can um, calculate... Um, using the simulation, this in my presentation would have rotated, uh, and as it rotates, it relaxes one supercoil, two supercoils, and you see that the simulation is on the microsecond time scale, 
which would not be possible with atomic uh, detail because number one, it's very long, and number two, it's very big. These are the two problems that I addressed at the beginning. Yeah? And uh, in this method, you can simulate basically in real time. It, it, it goes very quickly. Okay. Uh, by the way, please interrupt at any time, ask me questions, and I'm uh, selling here a lot of stuff, but there are, of course, approximations. There are limitations of when this works, so please let me know of, uh, of any questions. Okay, so maybe 10 more minutes? 10, ten, ten minutes is fine? Okay, good. Um, moving on. Uh, but still using the elastic uh, rod model, this time not for DNA, but uh, for a very exciting structure of uh, bacteriophage, bacteriophage T4. Um, this bacteriophage has a tail, like the tail of the other bacteriophage that I told you, but here the tail contracts. So, um, what happens is that the, the virus, yes, has this tail. It has some, you know, mosquito-like legs with which it attaches onto the surface. Um, I should say inside this sheet. So this is a, a, a cylinder that's elastic. It contracts, and inside that cylinder is a rigid tube that looks like a syringe through which, through the syringe, DNA is uh, injected into the cell, right? So the mosquito, the, the virus binds. There's a structural rearrangement here at the so-called base plate that produces a contraction of the tail and uh, Therefore, the needle is exposed and goes into the cell. And through this needle, DNA goes in and infects the cell and hijacks the replication machinery and produces new virions and so on and so forth. Okay, so we were interested in understanding this very intriguing contraction model that triggers infection. And uh, taking advantage of the structure of the sheet, um, we use elastic continuum model. Uh, the sheet is uh, made of six, not two, but in this case six uh, helices uh, made of proteins. Each of the helix is made of a monomeric protein. Right? So I have many, many, many proteins here, and I have six helices uh, curling around each other. It's a very large system, forget about atomistic simulations, but taking advantage of the structure, we are going to model each helix with elastic, uh, elastic rod model, right? We know the structure, we cannot do all the, uh, all the atoms, but we know the structure of each monomer. We put a few monomers together, we calculate their stiffness, uh, to uh, bending and twisting. We have the elastic rod model, and then uh, in this way we can uh, calculate um, the contraction dynamics of the sheet. That's another application of elastic continuum. Um, let's see how in depth we went here. This is going to be the last... Uh, uh, the, the last... Uh, system that I'm going to present. Okay, um, in yet another uh, intriguing viral system, you know, I told you how DNA is packed inside the virion, very high pressure, and there comes a moment when it has to get out. So the question is, how does it get out? What happens there? Um, so, uh, and how does it get in? Um, to get in, there is a rotating biomolecular motor um, in uh, magenta here, in pink or whatever color this is. 
This is a, a motor that um, is five-fold symmetric, yeah, and it um, pushes DNA by rotating it as you would uh, with a corkscrew, saka kocha. Yeah, it, it rotates and, and goes in. Um, um, however, the um, the hole through which it goes in is six-fold symmetric. Yeah, and people have uh, um, yeah the the so-called portal, this red uh, structure, this which is hexameric. Six big proteins form. Uh, a portal, form a, 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 a tube, right, through which the DNA passes. This in, uh, in noodle representation is the uh, motor that pushes the DNA. This red thing is the portal through which DNA goes. And this is the bottleneck. It's the narrowest point through which DNA goes in and out. So the question was, uh, does DNA actually... Um, rotate as it goes out or does it translate? For a very long time, because of the symmetry mismatch, five to six fold, people thought that it's going to be a saca corcho, that it's going to rotate. However, when Carlos Bustamante at Berkeley did a single molecule experiment, this time using fluorophores, put the a fluorophore put a, put a molecule on the DNA and one effectively on the portal and uh, noticed as the DNA rotates right as the as the DNA rotates it increases or decreases the fluorophore on the DNA increases or decreases its distance to the other fluorophore so if the DNA would rotate yeah if it would rotate you would see changes in the color of the FRET experiment. But no change in color was seen. So uh, taken at face value, the experiment would conclude that there is no rotation. Okay? And so uh, it's, it, it was intriguing for us to try to understand um, by simulation what is going on. So, we took the structure of the portal. What was in red now is yellow. This is our simulation. This is the DNA inside. This time there's no elastic continuum because the DNA that counts is small enough and it is located in a structure that we can actually simulate atomistically. So, we just put the DNA in. We bathe everything with, with water and counter ions. And we do exactly what we're looking for. We are either pushing the DNA back and forth or, and or rotating the DNA. So we have a very complicated atomic structure, but we reduce it to two degrees of freedom. Translation of the DNA and rotation of the DNA inside the portal. And... Um, for each of those um, translation degree of freedom and the rotation degree of freedom, we calculate the free energy. Yeah, we do a long simulation at each value of translated and rotated DNA, and we calculate what is the local free energy. And we put it on a two-dimensional map. This is like a like an egg crate potential, right? A surface with minima, maxima, and saddle points. And um, taking advantage of the symmetry of the system, we actually do only one little square, and then we, we, we replicate periodically because we can. Um, yeah, so if this is correct, and you know, we hope it is, we believe it is, then on this potential is going to, this potential is going to describe dynamically what happens to the DNA. How? Well, 
before I explain that, um, let's think about the translational coordinate, right? You have DNA that's being pushed through the portal. Pushed by what? By a force, the effective force from the pressure inside, right? Well, this calculation is in the absence of a force. So if I take this egg crate potential and lie it horizontally, right, it's going to be on a perfectly horizontal surface. But this direction of translation feels no force in our calculation. If it would feel a force, what would happen to the potential? It would tilt, correct? Because force times translation is an, in an ever-increasing energy, which will tilt the potential. Okay? Similarly with torque. If I, uh, when I do the calculation, when we do the calculation, the rotational degree of freedom doesn't feel any torque. Where would the torque come from? Well, when DNA uh, goes out, it is very much supercoiled inside, right? So there is a torque on it, uh, but not in the flat uh, accurate potential. If you had a torque in the accurate potential, it would tilt, again, the plane in the respective coordinate. So we have tilting this way because of the torque, and we have tilting this way because of the force, forces and torques, which you can estimate. So when you think about how DNA goes out, if there wouldn't be force and torque, you'd be looking for the lowest free energy pathway. So you start here. Where is the lowest free energy pathway? It is here. Right? So you go here to this other minimum, but as you do this, as you translate up, you're also going right, right, which means you're, you're um, building up torque. And now the torque is going to tilt the uh, potential energy surface this way. So instead of going to the next lowest minimum in the absence of the torque, you're going to go um, left. Okay, but going left, you're actually now, you have now relaxed the torque. So you can again go in the direction of the minimum path, and so on and so on and so forth. So uh, back to the question, is there rotation or isn't there rotation? If uh, there wouldn't be rotation, right, this would go straight up with zero rotation, correct? Um, if there would be rotation, this would just keep going diagonally, right? Rotation would increase. Instead, what this model predicts is that, yes, it does translocate. It goes higher and higher, therefore increasing the translocational coordinate. But it uh, rotates only to a small extent to relax its torque as it comes out. Okay, so this means that the reason for which the experiment didn't see the rotation, it's not that it doesn't rotate, but the rotation that it does is on a length scale that is so small that you cannot discern it in the FRET experiment. The distance doesn't change that much to change the color in the FRET experiment. Okay, so this is the model. You can think of it. Um, Experimentalists think of it as this uh, Chinese finger trap model where instead of where you put your fingers inside this toy and you cannot actually take them out unless you wiggle the fingers a little bit uh, to, uh, you know, to be able to, to translate your fingers out. Okay, so this is uh, the last system that I've talked about for which now that you have the uh, potential energy landscape as a, as a double check, we went and calculated from this free energy barriers in the presence of the partial torque, what are the kinetics? Because a separate experiment calculated the rates of ejection and uh, we were able to, to confirm that it's in the same uh, order of magnitude. Okay, so... This is it.
Thank you very much for your attention. What have I talked about? I talked about a, a framework in which I um, uh, use stochastic integrals to describe the weight of trajectories in order to enhance calculation of kinetics. Uh, I talked a little bit about single molecule experiments. I didn't talk about fluctuation theorems, but if you're interested in them, I'd be more than happy to, to do this. And uh, I have talked about an elastic continuum model that we have used in various instances to describe various uh, relaxations of uh, filaments, be uh, uh, you know either uh, DNA or protein and serous filaments. Thank you very much for your attention. pero creo que no está podrían encender el micrófono okay let's let's go to the oh, thank you very much so uh, thank you very much Juan, for this wonderful talk thank you very much uh, let's Pleasure. move to the questions uh, yes, please. He, here and then then here can, can you come a little bit forward please thank, thanks for your wonderful talk I, I actually have two two questions on on, on different kind of topics. The first one is more of a technical nuance question regarding the onsager math loop uh, theory. Action. Mm -hmm. When you're uh, thinking of... Uh, can, can I uh, please let me uh, move, move this thing uh, down. Yes. When, when you're thinking on, on ultra-fast kinetics, because you're, you're thinking in, in small uh, timescales, yes. you would be in, in the non-equilibrium regime of the onsager math loop theory, right? Yes. And if I recall correct, the weighting function on the non-equilibrium regime is an ornstein ullenbeck process and not a negative exponential. And I, I thought that I, I saw that you put a weighting function that it's a negative exponential, that that's the equilibrium measure uh, and okay. not the non-equilibrium measure. Okay, so um, when... Um, uh, so I, I should uh, uh, back up when... We, when I said non-equilibrium, I meant uh, time-dependent. Not, not, uh, not uh, so. Um, the system is at equilibrium. Yes, and it starts in uh, a certain part of the configuration space, and it evolves at equilibrium in another part. Okay, okay, so you're, so, you're in the so the time regime. correlation functions are equilibrium time correlation yeah. functions. That's uh, yeah, time dependent. Yeah. We, we're not in a situation in which, uh, uh, say, uh, we don't have a Boltzmann distribution because it's a non-equilibrium, say, steady state. It's, it's I believe that's where yeah. w what you're uh, alluding to applies. Yeah, and uh, thank you. And my second question is just a brief curiosity question. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in gene regulation and gene regulation. Uh, in, in eukaryotes, mm -hmm. uh, in humans, actually. And uh, the, the three-dimensional DNA structure inside the nucleus, it's really uh, ultra-cold. Yes. Yes. Have you explored this, this uh, time, type of, of, of treatment to, to such kind of problems? Because yeah. it... Now, now we have experimental yeah, yeah. data, high C data, and, yeah, yeah. and so forth. Uh, so you're talking about the way in which DNA wraps around histones, probably. Histones and how, for instance, chromosomes are uh, uh, tied packed. to each other uh, and, and uh, compacted. At an even larger in scale, yes. yes. Um, no, although we can apply this, uh, this wasn't a system we did. We only did it indirectly. We uh, took... Um, the, we took a piece of DNA that would be wrapped around the histone, but without a histone, and we tried to understand what happens with it um, from the point of view of a very intriguing phenomenon. Here I'm going off a tangent. You know that you have uh, ATCG, the mm -hmm. base pair, and um, uh, what can happen in certain instances 
is uh, very, this is only very recently been observed. There's a conformational change from a Watson Crick base pairing to a so called Hookstein, yep. when one of the base flips over and hydrogen bonds again, but in another conformation. So we, we were interested how does twisting, especially in, in histones, uh, modulate this uh, Watson Crick to Hookstein transition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, very nice talk. Um, kind, I, thank I'm you. just uh, to clarify some of the things um, is that normally bacteriophages have uh, the DNA inside it. Sometimes it is very well uh, arranged on a toroidal shape. Yes, yes. And sometimes also there are some molecules, small amines, that help. Yes. Highly charged, that. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, positively charged. Positively Normally charges. for positive charges mm -hmm. inside. Spermidine and, and spermine, I believe, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Chuck Nobler and Bill Gelbar measure the pressure inside by doing experiments, osmotic uh, pressure experiments. Osmotic, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, normally, the pressure inside the capsid by the DNA is about 40 atmospheres. atmospheres. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that helps when they infect bacteria to, because of that high pressure, the DNA gets Go inside the bacteria. Mm -hmm. But Correct. not all DNA can be released as part of DNA gets yes. inside. Especially the after pressure decreases. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a group in the Weizmann Institute did that, uh, that, that experiment. And the rest of the DNA uh, gets out totally by kinetic energy, basically. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah, because the, the already uh, injected part pulls on yeah, the yeah, remaining, uh, yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Like 80% mm -hmm. like of, of the yeah, DNA yeah. is injected and the rest uh, gets released by, by yes. the kinetic energy. I see, okay, mm -hmm. okay, that's good to know, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jaime and Enrique. So, um, okay, I think we don't have too much time for another question. I have another one, but I can ask you. No, no, in the, the lunch. Okay, thank you very much, Johan. We please. Uh, and uh, please, uh, in the name, ah, Johan, don't, don't, don't go yet. We have a small present for you, which is a notebook from the conference for all our speakers. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So, uh, so now we move forward uh, with uh, Enrique Hernandez Lemus talk. You have to put that on the for the for the for the computer. So um, please uh, be welcome, Enrique. Thank you very much for accepting our. of Mexico City, right, Enrique? Okay, uh, and also at the Center of Complexity Science, UNAM, which is also known as C3, C3, which is uh, located very near Universum for all those who know um, the UNAM campus. So I guess we are on time, Enrique, is that right? Okay, thank you very much again, and Enrique is going to talk about uh, the breast cancer protein expression landscape. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm actually really happy to be here. I, I guess I have been, if not in all, in most of the BioFist conferences, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. 
So let me understand how this works. Is the other way around? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I will talk about uh, recent work we have been, been doing in, in my lab regarding uh, regulatory networks. We have been studying gene regulatory networks for quite some time, and now I, I will be talk about our first, let's say, uh, adventures into protein co-expression networks, which actually were uh, something we, we have been pursuing for a long time, but as you perhaps know, experimental proteomics data is not that abundant, is not that reliable, is complex, is, 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 is difficult to get, but uh, at the end proteins are the most fundamental building blocks and the most fundamental molecular players, the machines that runs the cells and the tissues, so these are important to, to understand bi biological phenomena, their abundance and their interaction patterns are really important to determine what happens in the cells. Uh, and this is true uh, for the organs and even the organisms in health and in disease. I mean, one of the National Institutes of Health, we are interested in, in how uh, normal cellular functions are affected in disease. So this is something that we have been pursuing, and in particular in, in the context of, of cancer, in the context of how uh, abundance of proteins and, and, and their uh, interactions are important for tumor tissues. So I, I will present you some uh, advances on, on uh, what we actually know of on the patterns of abundance on, on the co-occurrence of a large number of proteins. I would like to say full protein, but that's, that's a tricky thing to say uh, due to the experimental constraints. And we will con compare some of these issues with the, hen the healthy counterparts. And I, I guess we, we are, uh, for the most part, uh, I'm a statistical physicist by training, so for the most part, we are rediscovering the wheel. We are finding th some things that uh, biologists have known for some uh, time. But, uh, and, and this I, I want to stress, from, let's say, first principles. So we, we, we are acquiring some fundamental understanding of how things happen and why these things happen and not just what is happening, right? And the final goal is not uh, just uh, one of basic science. I'm a basic scientist, but our final goal is being able to provide uh, some information to, to make that uh, clinical oncologist and pharmacologist can do better th their job. So uh, perhaps you, you know already this meme, right? Uh, you know the, this meme. Well, uh, act actually, th there, there's a, a very nice uh, anecdote by Professor Moshinsky, which uh, several of us know. And he used to say that uh, th there are two, two kinds of problems in physics. The ones that are solved by a harmonic oscillator approximation and the ones that you cannot solve. And he used to say that the duty of the theoretical physicist, he was a, a quantum physicist, was to uh, move problems from one set to the other, right? Uh, but uh, as you probably know, uh, Dawkins says that uh, memes actually evolve. So um, let, let me evolve a little bit this uh, meme. Uh, so, well, I'm a statistical physicist by training, so most things in the universe to me are random fields, so I will of course, turn the breast cancer uh, problem into a random field problem. So the, the talk will proceed with the following set of transformation. I will start with, I, I don't know whether the pointer works, but I will start with uh, a tumor tissue. This, this is an immunostochemical uh, photograph of, of a tumor, and I will move, uh, I will transform, I will tell you later how, I will transform this into a random field, and then I will move this random field to a graph, and I, then I will study properties on the graph to learn something about the tumor. So that's the way it works. And of course, I will be a little bit more, uh, I will provide further detail. So let me provide a, a little bit more detail. Uh, the data we started, and, and this is really important to say, uh, I'm uh, a little, uh, I, I'm a participant on a really large collaboration, uh, international collaboration, which is called the 
uh, ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium. And the goal is to actually understand uh, at the molecular level what is happening with the tumors. That there's like a thousand uh, of scientists of all around the world, and like perhaps half of the scientists are actually theoreticians. So there, there's a bunch of people trying to do things. And this is important because most, uh, I mean, uh, cells uh, are uh, very heterogeneous and tumor cells are really heterogeneous. So in order to build reliable models, you need lots of data for many, many individuals. And uh, this is expensive and very complex data to get. So if it weren't for such uh, large collaborations, we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to, to build even these uh, relatively simple models. So there's a, a website for, for uh, the, the other thing that I want to say, and I'm a very strong advocate for open science, is that the full data set for these experiments is, is publicly available for anyone. And it's actually the post uh, uh, archived in, in an NCI uh, website, a database a portal with an API, so you can download easily, relatively easily, the data. Uh, and from the data, the data is uh, from uh, MS, MS uh, mass spectrometry experiments on hundreds of samples. So it's hundreds of samples for proteomics. It's uh, complex to get. I will get uh, this in a moment. Oh, actually, a little bit faster. Okay. And from this, I will uh, build what I call a proteogenomic expression matrix. It's a proteome a protein abundance matrix, but the annotation uh, is given not only with regards to the protein, but uh, also in regards to the genes, because, because the biological functions of the genes are more comprehensively annotated than those of the protein. So in order to map some of the functions, we will need some of these. And there's a bunch of work in, in data preparation and data preprocessing and data curation. I will not bored you with it. I, I will uh, I'll only mention it uh, briefly because it's, it's, it's important. Uh, but once we do all this job of disentangling all the possible biases in the data, what we do is uh, we end up with a matrix that has the abundance of the proteins in several, in hundreds of, of samples. And from this uh, data, I will construct the, the regulatory landscape. So we will uh, proceed in uh, two ways. In one way is more or less traditional way in biology. So we would perform differential expression analysis regarding uh, as, as compared with, with the control tissue, which is uh, healthy adjacent, t adjacent tissue to, to the tumor from the same individuals. And of course, study the, the processes and pathways and what is happening at the already known level, let's say. And I will also use random fields to, to actually build uh, co-expression networks and try to understand the structure and, and some consequences of this structure. Um, and then I, I will present some features that are revealed by this structure. So as, as I uh, said, it's really complex to get the data. So we start with uh, patients at the hospitals not all patients are, even if they want to contribute, not, not all tissues are in, in uh, proper conditions to, to perform proteum uh, experiments. These are delicate experiments, let's say. So uh, we evaluate, well, the people in the, in the consortium evaluate the samples. Some samples are uh, actually get into the cohort and they, they undergone uh, detailed pathology and uh, quality control studies. Then it goes to a pipeline to analysis of the quality of the proteins and the uh, nucleic acids and, and so on. And then it's gathered in some centralized database. And the analysts, that, that's uh, where I work, and the clinical and the, they, they called the tumor boards, the, the people, they actually, the oncologists, are able to access the data. And the idea is that we are working back and forth in order to put these in terms that are understandable to clinical physicians, right? And, well, 
that the, this is a snapshot of the actual uh, portal. It's called the CPAC, the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium. It does not only have uh, breast cancer. I, I will present breast cancer, but uh, they have several tumor types and, uh, and a lot of uh, mass spectra and a lot of peptides identified and proteins and so on. And the actual experiments are phospro pro phosphoproteome experiments. So we are measuring proteins and phosphorylated proteins abundance. So it's a quote, quote, quantitative experiment. It's not full, fully quantitative, but it aims to be at least, uh, you, you have relative abundances, let's say. And it's, uh, we used uh, uh, an experimental uh, approach which is called the iTrack4 approach in which you have several different dyes, several different uh, tags or labels uh, to the samples, then you pull the array of several uh, tagged uh, proteins and perform mass spec uh, experiments and uh, well uh, HPLC and then mass spec and you have, and that's the interesting point, you have several let's say ion uh, peaks for each peptide and you combine the peaks, the peaks of the different colors and you have one single measurement which is semi-quantitative. So that's, that's nice. And then it's uh, the initial pre-processing. It's, it's all of this. I would, I, I would not get into the detail. And actually there's two things that may make this uh, bioinformatic pipeline really complex brief rant. One of the things is that proteins are very complex molecules and they are very unstable at some stages so you have to perform a lot of quality checks. Uh, the, the, the other is uh, actually capitalism because um, most of the companies have proprietary formats so you have to go from, from one closed format of data to another closed format of data to something that in the end becomes kind of open uh, human-readable or machine-readable data, non-binary non sources. So half of these things would be better if Thermo Fisher would be more nice people. End of my rant. And what the actual data source, source for our study is this, uh, has this form. It, this is a heat map of, of the a little piece of the, of the uh, data matrix of the protein expression uh, table and it's uh, reported as the log two ratio of the protein abundance of that protein identified by the set of peptides in the tumor as re uh, in, in with respect to the controls, right? And with this data, uh, we can actually start. And of course, it's, it's a random field, so I have to build a random field. And it's a relatively intuitive way of, of building, but the end uh, object we get is not so intuitive. So let me get, uh, you, give you some details. So let us suppose that the X represents the expressions of the proteins in the different samples, right? Uh, there is a way to know which proteins are statistically dependent on each other by, by using these uh, very well-known function, which is the mutual information function, that actually gives you the amount of information that you get about one uh, random variable, if you know the other random variable, and, and talks about statistical dependency. So I have all the proteins. I can calculate the inf mutual information on my random uh, sample universe for all the proteins. and. Roughly speaking, this is the um, joint probability measure, and these are the, con the marginal probability measures. E and from basic probability courses, you may recall that whenever two things are independent in the statistical sense, their, their joint uh, measure is the, proba the, the um, multiplication the, the, of the marginals, right? And whenever this is not happening, so the more this uh, joint probability uh, measure is different from the conditionals, from the marginals, uh, the, the things are conditional on each other, right? So I can get what degree of uh, 
statistical dependence I have between every pair of proteins in, in the experimental sample. I, at the moment, I'm not interested in self-interaction, so I'm removing the diagonal on, on my matrix. And then, once I build the matrix for all the possible pairs of control information things, I have to make two things. I have to put a threshold to determine when I said something is connected, something is dependent, because of course we have a lot of nonlinear dependencies and noises and things. And the other thing is that I want to map this really large stochastic matrix in an object that I can study. So the, the, this object is technically a functor. It's a mapping from the space of stochastic measures to the space of a graph. And it's actually the simplest possible representation of the random field. So if, if it were discrete and, and uh, complete in, in, in on a grid, it would be, let's say, uh, an icing model or something. But it's, it's more general than this. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, a random field with tens of thousands of variables and millions of possible connections. So it's, it's a huge uh, mathematical object. And all these functions are actually stochastic functions. And then people said, particularly oncologists and biologists say, could you explain it simpler? And in Spanish, we used to say, I, I will explain this with palitos y bolitas. So I will use little bits and little sticks. And, and that's precisely what I did, right? So once I have a graph, this is a nice graph. And the interesting uh, thing about uh, networks in, 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 in the modern context is that they are actually homeomorphisms of several types of, of objects. So you can, the same object uh, could represent it in, in several different uh, forms, and those forms are useful. So this is a graph, so I can use the topological properties of the graph to study some things. But this is also a probabilistic graphical model, so I can calculate conditional probabilities and joint probabilities from the graph. Uh, and this is also a conceptual model of a regulatory network, right? So biologists actually get a sense of my, my little drawings. So this nice picture, it's actually this function, right? And we can, once we have this object, we can use the tools of random matrix theory. We can use the tools of graph theory, of network science to study this object. And that's what I will uh, do. And actually, the first thing that, that comes, uh, this is uh, the, well, of course, you have, let me get back a little bit. Um, if you study large deviation theory, that, that's a little bit obscure field of st statistics, you may find that the mutual information functions actually follow a distribution with a long tail. And by setting a p-value of statistical significance, you, you could like cut the tail and get just the, the, the main mass of the probability distribution. So whenever I put a threshold, I get a fully uh, joint probability distribution with all the on draw links, right? All, all the, let's say, Every two random uh, objects, let's say every two proteins that are connected in the network pass the threshold. And the ones that do not pass the threshold are not connected. And this does not mean that, that they are independent, because they are not. They are conditionally independent given the ones that are actually connected, right? So whenever I do not draw a link, this link does not mean you could do anything. This means you could do anything as long as you uh, are compliant with all the constraints given by the rest of the network, right? And setting a threshold gives us the opportunity to set a statistical significance value. So the networks I will be talking uh, uh, henceforth have been cut off at a significant uh, p-value of 10 to the minus 8, right? And I'll tell you later why, why did we did choose this uh, 
cut off. And, and this is the, the actual uh, protein co-expression network. And one thing that uh, we found uh, really easily is that it has a modular structure. The, the, the nodes are colored according to uh, modularization, a, a, a community finding algorithm. Actually, we did, we performed several of these and the, the, the two better uh, performing methods were the stochastic block matrix and the Lupin um, community finding method. And this is actually a stochastic block matrix uh, renderization of this network. And we can see that this is uh, a clear modular structure. So we have like the pink module and the magenta module and, and the red module and so on and so forth. And the modules are even modular itself. So if I could this subnetwork and perform modularization analysis again, we, we have also models within models, right? Other important thing about the networks, that, that is whenever I cut a piece of the network and I get a soft plot of the network, since I cut several uh, links to, to get this out, I have additional conditional independence uh, conditions, right? But the resulting subgraph is again the full joint probability distribution. So I can think of it of this subgraph as a network itself, right? I can I can do this. So it has a well-defined modular structure. So proteins are organized in models. And then biologists came and said, okay, we already knew that, so what's new? And then I took every module and every sub-module, and we performed uh, a common uh, analysis in biology, which is statistical enrichment. It's, it's actually a simple hyper geometric uh, test. So I took all the proteins in my uh, module or sub-module. I count how many of them belong or are annotated regarding a certain biological function in, in the gene ontology biological processes database. And I perform a, a Fisher test, a hypergeometric test, to, to see whether we have more of these molecules in this set than would be uh, for uh, mere uh, hazard. Or if we have, uh, and we can calculate an enrichment p-value to see how difficult be to find this uh, set of, uh, this number of, of, of proteins in that category at random. And let me brag a little bit about our p-values. The, the limit of the graph is 10 to the minus 50, but actually uh, that's because of, of the graphing uh, tool. Or, or some of our models have an enrichment of 10 with a p-value of 10 to the minus 200, right? So it's difficult to think that they were like random appearances. And I, I didn't put the names, but those are actual biological processes and actually nested because the, the gene ontology uh, database is, is actually an ontology, so it's, it, it has structure, it has parents, branches, and, and children, and so on, right? So the network, the, the, the gene, co the, 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 sorry, the protein co-expression uh, landscape is not only modular, but the models are uh, well-defined or, or, or are uh, significantly enriched for given functions. So that's interesting. And as I was saying, some of the modules are even modular within uh, themselves. And we were able to see how some of the sub-modules within a module that in the beginning were not so much enriched or so much statistically significant on, on their enrichments regards to a given function. Actually, when we perform sub-clustering or, or sub-modularization algorithms, we find, for instance, that sub-cluster 4 and sub-cluster 5 of cluster 5 actually are very they are different subclusters, and whenever I look at each one of them, they are not uh, significant, but whenever I look at the two of them that are heavily connected, 
I have a function that arises. So let's say, like, to put it simple, a piece of this model is complementary to another piece of the model to perform a certain biological function. Again, this is in all agreement with all the intuition that the biologists have had for decades, but now is not intuition. I have the actual calculations, I know which molecule is connected to which other molecule and which kind of patient under what circumstances. So we are taking, let's say, the in intuition. So let's say we, we, we had intuition that things fall, right? But it's much better to have a gravity <laughs> theory, right? Yes, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we, we have all, all the topological properties study. I, uh, 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 you read the paper, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, actually, it's, it's between a centrality, and it's actually something connected with between a centrality that if I had imagined some 20 years ago, I would be immensely rich. It's the page rank centrality. Do you know the page rank centrality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the one that makes uh, Brin and Page very, very rich. Well, uh, actually, it's not only important to whom you are connected, but to whom your neighbors are connected, right? And to whom your neighbor neighbors are connected, so on and so forth. So we have eigenvector centrality, which is uh, one half of the diagonal of the uh, page rank centrality. It's, it's actually very closely related to it. And actually, we are, well, this, this, is, this was uh, the, the graduate th uh, thesis of one of my students. And we are moving on to uh, calculating not just the functions, but how these functions may be affected by perturbation experiments. And for the per perturbation, we, we, are, we built a model of uh, quote, 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 virtual cell, and we are perturbing the model of the, of the graph by adding some drugs and looking at how the molecules react to the drugs and how the, the uh, perturbation is, let's say, propagated within the network. So yes, it's, it's very important. The topological, and that's what, I, that, that's what I want to recall. The topological properties of the graph are important, and the probabilistic properties of the random field are important. So the conditional, uh, you, you have a certain, let's say, it's, it's not really a martingale, but you say you have a certain type of stochastic processes happening, happening inside the, the, the network, and the properties are relevant for the way the network is structured, but more importantly, to the way the network is responding dynamically. So yes, yes, that, that's, and of course, there's a lot of things that you can do, because at the end, this function you can represent by, by a matrix, and the matrix has a spectral decomposition, and the moments of the spectral decomposition of the matrix are relevant. Uh, one of the ways in which we can test whether these modules are actual models or are some artifacts is that you, you, you have the, the, the matrix, it's called the adjacency matrix, which is the, the representation of the graph. The, the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix are related to the clusters, and from the theory of stochastic matrix, uh, random matrix theory, you know that there, there's a distribution which is called the Marchenko-Pasteur distribution, which is the distribution of eigenvalues of a random network, of, of a random matrix. So you have a, a random matrix, you plot the eigenvalues, you have several realizations, thousands, millions of realizations of the random matrix, and all the eigenvalues fall, fall in this uh, Marchenko-Pasteur distribution. So that's the random occurrence, right? What happens with the eigenvalues of uh, an actual network with, let's say, functions with, with uh, clear meaning. Some of these eigenvalues do not fall in the 
Marchenko Pasteur distribution, and you, you can count how many of them do, do not fall, right? This would be use, useful also to, to guide uh, PCA that people in, in biology abuse, right? People do PCAs, uh, principal component analysis, all the time, and they are misleading themselves because the two components actually explain like 2% of the variance, but they are very happy because they have two components, right? Well, that, that's, that's uh, uh, a little bit of rambling. Let, let me go back. Uh, so we have structure on this uh, network, on this uh, protein co-expression network, and the structure is telling us that function arise from the structure of the co-expression network. So it has some even theliolo theleological uh, implications, right? The, the, the proteins are expressed when they are needed to perform certain functions. If you need several parts, let's say, and it is to a certain part uh, obvious, let's say you need several subunits of, of a molecular machine. You need all the pieces at the same time, right? So you need the cells to express the proteins concurrently, right? And, and we are capturing how the cells are expressing these, these proteins in a, in a concurrent manner. And let me go to, okay, I said there are enriched functions, which are these, ah, I'm, I'm going backwards. Which are the functions? And you can see that several of these functions are actually relevant to tumor biology. The, the dark blue bars are statistically significant enrichments uh, as at a corrected false discovery rate less than 0 0.05. These are all blue or dark blue. We, we will uh, move uh, along later on and we will see uh, some that are not actually that significant. But some of them are really important, like for instance, the complex remodeling and, and all these uh, things that are related to proliferation, right? Tumors need to proliferate, these are actually Primary tumors, primary breast to cancer tumors that are proliferating, the, they are uh, still dividing, and you have these, you have uh, some processes related to immune system evasion. I will move on to, to that uh, a little bit later because perhaps the biggest uh, finding that we, that we did is that some uh, of the ways in which the, the tumor cells are evading uh, pharmacological interventions is by, let's say, uh, ransoming the, no, ransoming, no, sequestrating the, the, the immune system, right? So several of these processes, uh, I, I can direct you to, to the actual uh, paper and, and, and the information to these, for these processes, and actually perhaps, that, that's a weird thing, but perhaps some of the more important parts of the paper are actually the supplementary materials because we have tables on these and intergra interactive graphs to, to, to perform some analysis on your own and, and so on. Uh, so we have the co-expression networks has modules, well-defined modules, statistically significant modules that are also statistically significant and rich for particular uh, functions related to tumor biology and of course uh, these uh, biological processes uh, gave us some understanding, but the clinicians want to know what is happening and the pharmacologists want to know what is happening at the biochemical, at the molecular level. So the functions are right, but the pathways are better, right? So let, let, let me go to the pathways. And some of the pathways annotated in, in the KEG database are actually related to ways in which the molecules are different from the, the healthy counterparts. And do not be misled for, by some of these names. The, the actual pathway names are really misleading. The problem is that the, the molecules are too large to call it like a UPAC. But let's say viral myocarditis. And you would say viral myocarditis pathways are not related to cancer. But they, these are actually inflammation. So whenever you get a viral infection, you get infection, and then you get inflammatory processes. And the, the, the biochemical pathway, which is called viral myocarditis, myocarditis is, is actually a pathway related to inflammation. So 
it has sense to be in cancer. And sometimes you will have Alzheimer's disease and, and things that you think that you are having very stupid results, and they are not, <laughs> usually. So uh, the ones in, in dark blue are, are statistically significant at the 0.05 FDR, FDR uh, cutoff. The others are not significant at, at this cutoff, so they may be uh, false positive findings, but anyways, they have enrichment ratios large enough to be of interest, let's say. And perhaps uh, I, I should add that as more samples are available, we would recalculate, right? Because these things are, are quite heterogeneous, so we may be fooling ourselves for statistical reasons. We don't think so because we have good, good statistics, but anyways, the larger the, the end, the happier we are, right? Also, and this is really interesting and, and is in contrast with what happens at gene regulatory networks, if you have worked with, with gene regulation, you would see that you have very heterogeneous patterns of expression, so you have some uh, genes that are highly correlated, highly expressed genes that are highly correlated with, with very lowly expressed genes, and, and the, the, the dynamic ratios of gene expressions are very diverse, right? And in contrast, uh, this is a, 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 the, the color corresponds to, to the actual log for change. So we have blue means, uh, that, that's uh, something that I need to say. Blue means that uh, these molecules are underexpressed as uh, relative to the, to the controls, and red means that they are overexpressed, right? And people use red and blue and red and green, and sometimes it's a problem because some people are colorblind. So. But for, for, for uh, these uh, matters, the red uh, nodes are highly expressed proteins, and the blue nodes are lowly expressed molecules as compared with the control tissue. And of course, it's, it's not perfect, but we have modules that are significantly underexpressed, and we have other modules that are significantly overexpressed. And this calls to attention. And some functional modules are almost completely downregulated. So this one calls to attention. And it's interesting because uh, I, I was not aware of what are these proteins because they have these complex chemical names. And for me, the molecules are called ABC. <laughs> uh, but it was very interesting when, when I analyzed because that's the complement, uh, the complement system uh, pathway. And the colors here are the actual colors of, of the full uh, experimental database. So. Do you recall that green means underexpressed, right? Well, that, uh, this, this uh, tool does, does not allow me to put blue. That's green, but green is underexpressed. And basically, the full complement and coagulation pathway is turned off, is not working in, in these tumors. So you, you all, all, this is the actual pathway, and the pathway is colored red, uh, green. So it's, it's, it's shut down. And this is really important because the complement system is of central uh, importance to regulate immune response. So let's say it's, it's like a hub that gets the information for the different immune responses and, and kind of directs how the cells react to certain stimuli, right? And having this important hub for immune responses shut down is critical because whenever you try to use drugs, even immune, first of all, immune modulators that are uh, very effective drugs in some cases against cancer, but also even if you have cytotoxic drugs, even if you have, let's say, platinum or, 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 or bincristine or, or some of these uh, really awful drugs, uh, most of the way they kill cells is by inducing apoptosis, and some of the pathways that lead to apoptosis inductions are actually mediated by the complement system. So having the complement system shut down 
in hundreds of samples of very well characterized uh, individuals, it's something to be worried about. Um, okay, we have been studying gene regulatory networks for more than a decade in my lab, and we wanted to know we, we have the same samples, the same set of samples, the same set of mathematical ways to deal with the uh, quality controls and, and, and to build the networks, and we were like, okay, how much of the protein co-expression patterns are captured by the gene co-expression patterns? And the actual answer is a very little. <laughs> the structure is, is really different. These are, uh, this is two, two, two uh, visualizations of, this is the gene regulatory network for these samples using the same threshold for the mutual information. The colors correspond to chromosomes. We have been studying this phenomenon in which gene regulatory networks in cancer are actually strongly cluster the interactions by chromosome. Perhaps uh, this has to do with, with, with that transcriptional event that is occurring locally in, in these genes. We, we are not sure yet. We have been studying this for like eight years and we still do not understand fully. And protein co-expression is, of course, independent of the chromosome. It does not depend on the chromosomes. It does depend on the type of biological functions that the proteins are performing. Uh, so that's it, right? So let me, uh, I don't know how I'm in time, but let me summarize because I'm always getting late. So in conclusion, we have performed probabilistic inference of protein co-expression networks. Uh, this has been done in the more, in the larger and more comprehensive quantitative proteomic data set that is available today on breast cancer tumors. We have found that the network has a well-defined uh, hierarchical modular structure, so proteins are not just randomly expressed, they are actually well organized. These modules, we have strong uh, evidence to support the, the fact that they are enriched for biological functions and for, or, and for given molecular pathways, and even that these uh, expression patterns correspond to well differentiation, uh, differentiated patterns of abundance. And of course, next thing we have to do is, is to study the ribosomes because they're, 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 they, they, they may be central players in these uh, particular uh, concurrent expression patterns that are happening. Many of these processes and functions correspond to well-known uh, hallmarks of cancer, uh, molecular and physiological characteristics of cancer, and the structure of the breast cancer network is uh, quite strikingly different from the one of gene regulatory networks. And finally, uh, a call for collaboration. We, we need uh, to grow on, on these collaborative efforts uh, to get large data samples in order to understand complex biological phenomena. And in particular, protein co-expression networks can become, I, ha I think that they have the potential to be an extremely important tool to, to study cancer, but in order for this to, to actually be useful in the clinical and, and in the pharmacological setting, we need this uh, evidence to be stronger, and for this we need to have available larger and more comprehensive, and I, I actually stress trustworthy because I, I'm not rambling against uh, the, the, the proteome scientists, but the, these uh, experiments are actually really difficult to get clean, to, to get rid of, of the experimental noise. And of course, these are probabilistic uh, methods, so they are very sensitive to experimental noise. So uh, it will be excellent to have uh, better, better data uh, sets. Of course, this is not work I done myself. This is work of uh, a lot of people. And in particular, this is uh, part of the graduate thesis of Martin Ruhl, uh, that, has, uh, that was a graduate student in my lab. And with this, I'm, I'm open to questions. Hola. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, please, uh, we have some time for questions. So I guess Professor Jaime is coming for one question, and then we are moving forward another one. So please, Jaime. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, very nice. Um, I was wondering if we know the mechanism how cancer is induced by the contra contraceptives, uh, especially in women. 
uh, well, uh, I'm not a cancer biologist, mm -hmm. but I, I have been studying uh, pathways in, in cancer for several times. Uh, my uneducated guess would be that uh, hormone signaling would be relevant. And in particular, because several of the hormone receptors, let's say the estrogen, the androgen, the progesterone receptors, are all they are upstreams of PIK3 uh, pathway, which is linked to proliferation. Mm -hmm. So my guess would be that hormone disruption leads to uh, the regulation of the MAP kine kinase uh, pathway, uh, basically the, the PI3K pathway, and this leads to AKT upregulation, and this leads to proliferation. L lots of DNA uh, replication and lots of protein synthesis. So in a sense, I mean, th that's the way hormones work, right? So mm -hmm. you, you have estrogen uh, and you have uh, sexual dimorphisms and you need cells to grow, to, to expand the hips and to expand the, the breasts and so on. So my very ingenious uh, answer would be that hormone dysregulation leads to uh, proliferation and this enhanced by the other hallmarks of cancer, which is, I mean, proliferation is not that bad if you have apoptosis, right? Mm -hmm. We of have, let's say I, I'm, I'm walking here from Imogen and I get a callus on my feet. Mm -hmm. So I have proliferation, I have more cells, but they die because they became a, a callus and then they fall. So there's a balance between proliferation and death and you're okay. But if you have more proliferation and you have, let's say, diminished capabilities to die, then that, that, that would uh, become uh, oncogenic, in my, my opinion. I guess we have a couple of minutes. If, if anyone would like. Yes. Okay. Please, uh, Pavel. Thank you, Enrique, for your nice talk. Uh, well, I, I don't know very much of the details, but uh, I was wondering, um, when you talk about the first principle the study of the, uh, this um, co-expression genes or proteins, and you reproduce these net networks, um, do you have a, a model to actually reproduce the network, or you build the, the network uh, based on the experimental tests that, that you perform? This is the first question, and the second question is that if the network is dynamic, I mean, if it depends on the time, and if these uh, dynamical networks doesn't change the topology of the network. Okay, two very interesting questions. The second one actually striking my heart because I, I will tell you. Uh, the first one, uh, we built the networks from empirical data, but the data is very noisy, so we need to be aware that we are not just fooling ourselves, so we built a lead. We simulate a lot of uh, random networks to build uh, neural models for our probability uh, ways of doing this. And actually, there's a generative model for, for complex networks. The generative model is called the stochastic block matrix. If you recall, recall block matrices in quantum mechanics, that's the same way of thinking. So you have, let's say block matrices are like Lego parts. You have a complex density, uh, probability density function. And you have this complex probability density function by adding block functionals, right? We did basically the same to, to, to build this uh, because let us recall that aside of a graph, this is a joint probability distribution. It's a random field. So this field, we can build the field the, the, the very same way physicists build, let's, let's say, a force field. So I, I have one contribution, a further contribution, and, and, and let's say I have an expansion of, of different size contributions. I did exactly the same. And all of the contributions is a stochastic block of a larger matrix, and that's exactly what we did. We did this, uh, and actually this is the, the more time-consuming part of the work, <laughs> because in order not to fool, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to make the data analysis, but it's much more difficult to, to be sure that you're not fooling yourself. So 
We are building lots, actually hundreds of thousands of replicas of the network. And we are using even some ideas of, of molecular dynamics. We are using replica exchange to, to make it faster because they are very large network, uh, matrices. And the, the, the final network that we get and we are happy with is the one that is much better than the random generated networks. Of course, I am aware that different from the null model does not mean that you have the right model. <laughs> That's the best we can do. The second one is, is a, a, a very, very complex question to answer from the standpoint of a theoretician. Because what I would want, I don't want photographs. I would like to have movies, right? Instead of protein abundances, I would like to have time-dependent protein concentrations. That would be nice. But there's two problems, and actually one of the problems was, was already talked about in the previous talk, is the one of the time scales. First of all, I'm not uh, allowed to be sampling uh, breast cancer patients often. So I, I took the biopsy, well, when someone, uh, one, actual, one person who's actually able to do experiments took a biopsy, and from the biopsy we obtained the data. And the problem is we do not have a time point, we have a single time point. But even if we were able to have time points, the question is how often do you sample? Every second, every minute, every hour, because you have interesting molecular phenomenon happening in, in the time scale of seconds. DNA uh, transcription is, is happening in, in the time scale that goes from 20 seconds to 20 minutes. But nuclear export, protein production, protein folding, protein phosphorylation, protein assembly, oops, what's the time scale? That's the, the first problem. Uh, and, and actually is, is, is the biggest. So one problem is how to get the actual experimental samples, and the second is what is the best possible uh, time scale to, to, to time frame to, to make the analysis. The other one is that as the structure is changing, these uh, mathematical objects uh, that are actually static matrices become random matrices. So every entry on, so I have a very large stochastic matrix which, with numbers on it, right? If I had a dynamical system, I would have a very large stochastic matrix with random functions on each of the entries. There, there's theory, we have available theory to, to deal with this, but not with these sizes. The, these are uh, matrices of tens of thousands rows per, by tens of thousands columns. So, so if, I, I mean, it's overwhelming. But your intuition is right. I would be very, very happy to have those objects. Okay, uh, we have one last question, Hector, no? It's okay, sure, are you sure? Okay, well, thank you very much to um, Enrique. Thank you very much, Enrique, for this wonderful talk. Please, uh, this is more present for the conference for you. Okay, thank you very much, Enrique, again. And uh, now, just a brief announcement, uh, 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 announcement that would make you all happy, I'm very sure of that. So we have the coffee break now. It's in the terrace in the third, fourth floor. Well, you have to go upstairs uh, until you reach the, the, the roof. So uh, there's, the, there's now the, the coffee break, and we come back in 30, 30 minutes. Thank you very much.
Arturo Rojo Domínguez is, uh, I mean, is an uh, old collaborator in, 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 in and big researcher, excuse me, of uh, the WAM, no? and is, uh, has a long story uh, building this community, uh, forming new researchers, and uh, well, for me, it's, it's great to have you here. So uh, let's hear to Professor Arturo Rojo Domínguez. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be with you and uh, in this event. And uh, I want to talk about uh, molecular docking and uh, I called it simulation of intermolecular uh, recognition. And uh, it is um, in the main uh, application devoted to drug design. So uh, my talk will be divided in three parts. The first one is just docking, just to get the names and the proper nomenclature. Then I will see some new approaches, not mine, but on the literature about uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence on drug design. And then I will present uh, a couple of my results on, on docking in the way of drug design. And uh, I, I like to, I always want to say in the way too, because uh, sometimes uh, we think that the computer will give us the drug. And uh, it's just the first and little step, but necessary to, to be done. So uh, let's talk about molecular docking. And uh, um, you know, docking, like a dock where a ship uh, uh, parks, um, it's an analogy of a small molecule into an active or binding site that uh, it's the dock. So molecular docking is how to propose or simulate a, co a ligand receptor complex. And uh, the problem seems to be quite difficult. The examples that I will give is for, from uh, working in progress. And in this case, this enzyme is called HDAC. It's human and it's uh, the acetylase for human histones. The idea is that uh, this enzyme works uh, turning down some genes in tumors. So the treatments fail to, to fight against the tumors. The idea is to inhibit the inhibitor in order to get uh, the expression of the genes and that the treatment works again. That's the idea in long term, but uh, I will use it as an example of docking. And uh, uh, this picture seems quite complex, and more if we think that we have in this side uh, mo uh, almost 6,000 uh, atoms and a small molecule of 42 that uh, must be docked or put in the in a right place into the into the structure. This structure seems to be random, but it is not. In reality, it's a long uh, polymer, a long peptide that folds itself, that, and that would give us uh, too many other uh, talks about protein folding. But it folds itself and catalyzes uh, its own folding. And uh, can you follow the lines? It starts here. And maybe if we color it from red to blue, it would be easier to see that it's a single chain folded uh, itself. In terms of docking, the importance is not the way it is folded, but its molecular surface or structure. So this is the, the structure. And can you see some things that are relevant for you in this picture? Imagine that you must do the docking. 
looking for some cavities. Have you eaten some guava or strawberry fruit and you have a seed in the, uh, in the teeth? They, uh, they always uh, allocate in cavities, right? I, I don't mean cavity in, in clefts. <laughs> well, so we have to look for clefts. So uh, the second derivative of the surface will give you if it is convex or concave. And uh, we can have those colors in order to know where the ligand can be allocated. So red uh, places are uh, convex zones. And you can see a particular region, sorry, a particular region in this place, for example, but it's so plain and big. Maybe this one, but it is small. And there's a particular one that is a tunnel that, that is also the active site of the enzyme. Most of the active sites are, uh, uh, this, uh, have this, this type of uh, spaces where the substrate uh, gets into and is transformed. Uh, but uh, now we're trying to put the inhibitor just in the, in the active site. And then let's think about an algorithm. Imagine that you have these parts, but they are soft. You know they are just coordinates. So you can put the small molecule in any place in space and in every orientation. And you can test every, uh, every one of them. If you choose it at random, some of them will be far away from the receptor and some others may invade or be completely inside the molecule. Both results are not uh, acceptable. So we need to have a tangential contact, a soft contact between the ligand and the surface. So it is done with these uh, dummy atoms that are just spheres the size of an atom that rolls all the surface and mark the specific places of the surface where an atom, maybe a carbon, an oxygen or a nitrogen, can be allocated forming a particular type of good contact. But these are not real atoms, it's just spheres. And the points that you see there um, are the best places where an atom of a ligand can be allocated. This guides the search for possible uh, complexes or possi uh, possible positions of the ligand inside this, the site. Maybe somebody can ask why some are white and some are red. Nobody? It's a joke in order to, to make you speak and, and uh, ask a question. No? Well, <laughs> uh, it's the uh, hydrophilicity of the surface. The red ones are uh, donors or acceptors of hydrogen bonds or uh, ionic contacts, while the um, gray ones are hydrophobic contacts. So you, if you have a particular ligand, you can choose some of these dummy atoms and not looking for random positions inside the active site, but for do those that uh, better satisfy the contacts. Is it clear? It, is it, uh, does it make sense? So, so? Yeah. Uh, since most uh, of the compounds have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, they are almost the same size. So it's a standard size for, for the contacts. Yes. Yes, yes it is. It's zinc. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the enzyme and the active site. So I also, I guess this molecule is very porous. You know, it's got a, a pore, pore inside. Yes, it has some inside. And also has a structural water molecule at the very uh, back of the tunnel. Yeah. 
that uh, you have to decide if you uh, remove it to fill it with your compound or if you consider that it's uh, a structural part of the system that you're trying to inhibit. Yeah. You know, in terms of energy, uh, it will be uh, highly energy cost. There will be a high energy cost to remove a water molecule strongly bound to the end. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, we have an algorithm now, now to put uh, the ligand and to, and to explore possible positions. Sorry, I, I, I'm not used to this control. Okay. Now, sometimes we know where the cavity is about. So we can explore just a part of the surface and that uh, give us the chance of explore more different positions. Imagine that you have a single molecule, like, like uh, right now, so it's not very important to speed the process. But sometimes you have to scan millions of conformers, maybe hundred, hundreds of conformers for, from each compound and maybe millions of compounds. So uh, reducing the time of search would be very important in those cases. It depends on the size of the uh, database that you are looking uh, in this case. Well, this is uh, the position of the crystallographic uh, ligand. And if we put it in surface, we can see that uh, they match in, in form, in the geometry, but also, believe me, in the contacts inside. So it's a very specific inhibitor and uh, also very toxic, so it cannot be used as a drug. But uh, it's a positive control to, do, to play with the, with the system. Okay, now let's go inside the, the molecule. And uh, I want to show you the form of the tunnel. Uh, here we turn in the vertical axis a little bit, and you can see that uh, it looks like a Sot, sorry. And uh, this is better. It goes maybe inside the, the molecule. And this is just making uh, transparent the surface. And it's the, the ligand uh, having the room And uh, uh, now we see the molecule inside the, the receptor. Sí. Gracias. And uh, also it's very difficult to see the, the contacts in that place, but we can uh, iron the, the uh, contacts and uh, see the different uh, positions in order to see if we can get better contacts and maybe uh, make a rational modification of the, of the molecule or looking for better contacts or maybe some of them are not uh, correct so we can look for a different molecule or cutting some of the uh, chemical uh, parts of, of the uh, groups of the molecule. Uh, can you see this bluish uh, reflect? That means that it's uh, exposed to the solvent, so this is the mouth uh, of the tunnel. This is the end of that, and there is a water molecule around here making contacts with the fluor atom. Well, now, uh, as you said, uh, there was a big round ball that it's a zinc atom, and another part of, of the, um, the contact 
means a coordination bond be, between the ligand and the, and the uh, ion, and the metallic ion. And, uh, well, and uh, this is the standard proce procedure to get uh, or, or to test a molecule inside an, an, act an active or a binding site. These two terms are not the same. A binding site may be any place in the surface that can uh, allocate the ligand, and the active site is the one that allocates the substrate of the enzyme. But sometimes it's the same, and in that place we're making a competitive inhibition, competing with the, uh, with the substrate. The next problem, and uh, I anticipated it uh, before, is which of these water molecules are structural and which of them are not. These are not solvent uh, water molecules, but crystallographic ones, those that were seen in the crystal of the structure of the, of the receptor that were seen by, the, by crystallographers. That means that those waters are not very mobile, but instead they have specific positions with some blurring depending on, on its uh, thermal motion. And some of them are not uh, mobile at all, like that one that I told you at the end of the tunnel. So uh, one of the caveats or the problems in this technique is to deal with water molecules and to discriminate which ones can be removed by a ligand and which ones can, uh, must remain as part of the structure. Well, the other problem is the ligand is not a rigid uh, form, but may have several different uh, degrees of freedom rotating its uh, single residues. So if we take this molecule, that is my, my example, and uh, make a conformational search in, strictly we have an infinite number of conformers but some of them are not uh, in minimum of energy. If we make the, the search, in this case, we found 44 energy minima, and the, in the picture, you can see the, f the best 10. With best, I said the, the lowest energy, energy minima. It has been seen that most of the ligands inside a binding site with high affinity have uh, structures or conformations very close to uh, their isolated energy minima in order to uh, not uh, to invest energy to turn some of the bonds. So it's a good idea to simulate the flexibility of the ligand taking some of the energy minima conformers and maybe the best 10 or up to 4 kilocal per mole respect to the uh, deepest minima conformation. Well, let's put it some uh, surface around them, just to see that uh, small changes in, rota in the rotation of single bonds can make strong differences that uh, make no match anymore inside of the, of the binding site. Well, this is the idea of uh, having different structures and different energy minima. This would be, in this uh, very simple scheme, the lowest energy. And in this case, <coughs> we have the crystallographic structure inside a binding site with respect to uh, the closest energy minima uh, of that molecule. And uh, this axis means uh, in a very simplified way, the conformation of the molecule. Well, okay, so molecular docking has a ligand, a receptor, and a procedure to put it together and to evaluate the contacts in order to distinguish or, or ranking which ones are the better poses of a single molecule and which molecules have better poses than other ones. 
And in this, play, in, in this uh, work or in, in this technique, you can uh, enrich a particular set of atoms in heats, meaning a heat, a compound that really has binding or inhibition in an experiment in vitro. So a heat is a um, real result. And we will get a lot of uh, uh, mm, uh, ne negative, false negative, false positive results. So not everyone, every good uh, ligand in docking will demonstrate its function inside the, the test tube. And also you will lose some false negatives that would have activity, but uh, it, uh, you discard it because they got a low score. So it, this is not the real um, constant en uh, equilibrium constant or the real energy of contact, but just an enrichment of the set of molecules you're working with. Well. Would you like to see the results of docking that molecule compared with the crystallographic? Say yes, please. Okay. Just because you said yes, we are showing here the crystallographic one in blue and the docked one in, in colors. So what's your opinion? Very, very nice, very close. And uh, we have also the contacts with the metal uh, ion. And uh, this is the mouth of the tunnel. So you see uh, some divergence because uh, you have a less restriction in that part of the, of the receptor. This is the inner part of the tunnel. You have less uh, possibility of uh, variation. But, um, and um, a way of, uh, of measuring how well is it is by the RMSD or the average of distance between equivalent atoms. So 0.7 uh, angstroms means that they are so close. Remember that uh, one of these lines is about one and a half angstroms. So an average of this one competes with the precision of the crystallographic technique. So they are the same in terms of the uh, uncertainty in the determination of the position of the crystallographic atom. So, very, very nice, right? No, I, I put it the best one without uh, telling the next, the next. This is, was not the best energy. <laughs> just, uh, just to convince you that it's very nice, the technique, but unfortunately, it's not the first one in energy. It was the best one, and I wanted to say, oh, well, I'm a good docker. But let's see the scores. The more negative, the more binding energy, right? So the best score is number one, the, the green one, but the RMSD is 1.2. It's not too far, you know, but it's not the best. We have three other ones, all of them represented with uh, tiny lines. And uh, I left uh, the fifth, that is the bold colored lines. So you can see that all of them are fine, nice, but uh, the best one is not the lowest energy, right? That's, that's the idea I want to transmit. And in this particular case, and uh, every system is a particular case, the sixth one is just turned around. Do you see this green atom? This is the correct position. And this one is the sixth one. Can you see the scores? So this, uh, this particular binding site has a form that is somewhat symmetrical. So the same molecule in two different orientations can give you very similar scores. So it's somewhat a nightmare, but the first uh, five 
are in good position. Nina, please. Well, these are, um, mm, yes, uh, somewhat arbitrary. They are called uh, kilocalorie per mole just because they are representing a, a binding energy. But uh, you cannot uh, trust that this energy is an absolute one. So I prefer to say that it's arbitrary and it's just, just uh, for comparison in a relative way, not in an absolute uh, value. Right, and then my follow-up question is, what is the resolution of this score? Because let's say that your scoring function is parametrized against a bunch of experimental data. Any fit has an inherent error with it because no fit is perfect to experimental data, right? So I have experience with Vina, and Vina has an error bar that is roughly three kilocalories per mole. So if this is the same scoring function, then if you only use the score, they are identical. You cannot tell them apart. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that you have something that helps you calibrate. But if you do not have something to help you calibrate, if you're doing really blind docking, how do you know? I, I think that it's blind in terms that uh, these numbers are just relative among them. And uh, the uncertainty is when you run a, sec a similar docking with the same uh, uh, parameters uh, in the run, the same receptor and the same uh, ligand, and you get different results, small dif different, because the search is random. So you, you, do, you did a sample of all the conformations that can be done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, then you can see the uncertainty on, on your runs between one run and the next, and you will have the, uh, the idea of what's the tolerance you, you must have to consider the same or different ones. I Thanks. did it, and, and, uh, and uh, it's more than uh, one hundredth of, of units. And, yeah. So I shouldn't put all, all four significant figures here. But consistent with, with Vina's sample sí. score, what if you consider the cost to be an actual energy, and you consider the fluctuations around this, this energy, perhaps the lowest surface around energies on average has all these possible okay you mean yeah I mean that looking around all, all over the surface yes uh -huh. uh, the best score always and for much is that no no you have these scores and instead of just calling them scores if you think about them as actual energies mm -hmm. since these energies come fr from multiple runs of the of the search you may think about the energy plus minus uh, fluctuation. Uh -huh. And the fluctuation but you surface. Mean the, the actual energy. Yes. No, no, it's not because <coughs> the score or the energy function, the fitting function in terms of an general optimization, is just an approximate. Oh. So it's not calibrated to reproduce actual energies that you measure. And we will see why we will see some of the forms of the of the energies in order to understand why you cannot trust on these energies as uh, the actual values. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's uh, more approximate than a force field used for molecular dynamics because you need to do it uh, faster. Okay. So, ah, this is a plot of RMSD, uh, and th this is the score. So, this is bad scores. This is the better scores. And here we have the fifth first uh, good results. This is the best in terms of RMS or distance. And uh, this is a cluster or a result of several poses very similar between them. With a pose, I skipped the, the definition, a pose is a combination of position, 
orientation and conformation of a particular compound in the binding site. So every complex has a pose of the ligand, right? Okay, so these are uh, five or six, six, uh, the six better poses, and this one is completely opposite, but with very similar score. You know, that, that it was what I wanted to say. If you take another molecular system and you do repeat uh, the same with other type of receptor, you will not find this, you find, find another type of cavit. So uh, it's very important to know your system and to be aware that uh, scores are not the best way of uh, um, analyzing the results. Well, this is an, an old uh, reference. I will put all the reference in a final slide in order if you want to take a picture of that. And uh, it's also in YouTube. Where's the, the camera? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we have the same on green or on color. Uh, you have the crystallographic one and the best docked position. So uh, it's six different systems just to show that uh, you can trust in getting the best pose of a compound with respect of a crystallographic position, but there's a trick. It's not any molecule. It's a molecule that crystallizes in that site. That means that you have a good affinity in order to get a crystal with the uh, molecule bound. If that happens, docking is very good. The problem is that you don't have the crystallographic position of the molecule because if so, you are not doing docking. So the problem is how to do it with a bunch of molecules of unknown binding properties to that site. Okay? Well, what have... Uh, I wanted to make this introduction in order to stress uh, the next ideas. Uh, in the receptor, more than the folding, the surface is the most important. And some of the surfaces, or most of the surfaces that we have for docking purposes come from crystallographic data. But in a crystal, you have protein-protein contacts because of the crystal that are absent in solution. So the surface must, may be disturbed by the protein-protein contacts of the crystal. So you must be aware, and uh, when you download a PDV, a protein data bank structure, sometimes you, know, you don't see the whole uh, unitary cell, but you see just a single molecule. So a good practice is to construct the unitary cell in order to see where are the contacts, in order to be careful with those parts of the surface, okay? The other part, well, docking is trustable to know to place known crystallographic. It must be, uh, I should have written here crystallographic uh, ligands. Is it clear why? Because a crystallographic ligand has high affinity, so docking is good for detecting the position of high affinity ligands. Right? Okay. Uh, the best post is not necessarily the highest score. Scoring functions must be improved. Experimental poses uh, are around one to two angstroms. I, I put it a nice one, but it was the type of the active site that was very constrained. But so, uh, most of the active sites are not so profound. They are not tunnels, but uh, just cavities. Okay? Docking is a technique to enrich. This is very important, and uh, that was, I think, my best learning in docking. You do not expect to reproduce reality. You expect that if you start with 1,000 molecules, maybe 1% 1 of them uh, are hits. I mean ligands that have some activity in the test tube. But if you do docking and you choose the, first, the, the best uh, 10 or 100 of them, maybe you will have 20 or 30% of hits, and 70% are false uh, positives, 
okay? That's very important in order to understand the results of, of docking. And, uh, uh, well, that's, uh, that's put there. And also you have to be uh, careful with the water molecules that comes from the crystal. Don't r get rid of them at first. Well, now let's uh, talk about uh, computer-aided drug design. And this is a nice list that is uh, uh, very often asked which drugs currently in pharmacy were designed by computer-assisted uh, docking or computer-assisted programs. And I don't want you to read all of this, just to see that many, some of them, okay? And um, every year, some new ones are, are coming. We will see a histogram of the new drugs coming uh, in the last uh, 10 years, okay, later. Well, in very different, uh, different uh, diseases, okay? Docking or the computer-aided drug design do not depend on the, too much on the statistical information of medical experience of, uh, of patients. They rely on the, know, on the biological knowledge of a disease. So you can uh, study very rare diseases with low statistics because the importance is to have a possible target, I mean a receptor, to study with different molecules, okay? So it's, it's, it's important because most of the first medicines or drugs were uh, developed for very popular or common diseases because you have the information of those patients. Okay, now this uh, spiral, I like it because I like colors and uh, this was a very color, colorful uh, picture, but uh, tries to represent in a very simple way the path for producing a real drug that you can buy or that uh, a doctor can prescribe. And this is the target information, I mean the receptor. So a lot of steps must be, uh, be achieved. First, identify, of course, which is, uh, is the ligand that you want to, to study. Also, to identify which molecules bind to that. Then, optimize. When, when I said you got a hit and it's um, active in the test tube, the, pot, uh, the affinity of that drug may lay, may lay maybe in the micromolar region. For being a drug to be considered and, and go away in this path, you must be maybe 1,000 uh, times better in the nanomolar uh, region. So this lead optimization means, okay, you have a hit. This is the lead maybe for a whole family of possibilities. And now you have to look for analogs of that molecule for a modification of some chemical groups of that molecule in order to get better affinities. And that's the optimization process. This process can be experimental by uh, chemical modification and making long, uh, large uh, libraries of derivative compounds or by computer-aided design or both. Then animal testing, sorry, and then the clinical trials, I mean this is non-human animals and humans. And later on the, the tests and, and the approval. Well, let's, let's see a little more detailed scheme of this same idea. This is just the introduction. And here we have the cost and the time of each step. If you zoom all the years we have here, it's about uh, 15 to 20 years to develop a new drug. If you think in, term, in terms of money, uh, you will need a lot of uh, million dollars for the development, but some of the steps that are computational, and I show you the part that I know that it's docking, are put in this place. 
So molecular docking is just a small part, uh, part of this path. And that's the idea I wanted to, to communicate to you at the beginning, that uh, when we say docking or interactions in drug design, we must be uh, very aware that we're talking, yes, drug design, but just a small part of the path, okay? Well, this is the percentage, the average percentage of failure in each step, and this path is not lineal. In reality, some of these parts of the path can, should be done several times because of this uh, percentage of failure. So every, every time you repeat one of these steps, you have to invert that time and that money. Okay, so it's not this, uh, the linear sum, but multiply by the times uh, you make every step of, of the path. From maybe 1,000 molecules tested, they will be discarded in each step to get one on shelf. Okay, that's the amount of approximately. Well, uh, this is a, a, a nice place where they use machine learning to speed up some of the, uh, of the steps. That is a different uh, path than docking. In machine learning, you have no chemical or physical idea of what's going on, but looking for correlations and trying to get an artificial intelligence to make all those correlations without uh, uh, physical principles, right? Do you feel right with that? <laughs> it's around us uh, everywhere. <laughs> okay, well, this is a reference. I know that you cannot uh, see it, but uh, we will see it all together later. This is a, a nice um, article from uh, archives of pharmaceutics where they um, show like um, a story of how they will, um, how they optimize the first molecule in order to get the second one, in order to get the third one, and so on, in order to having better and better affinities. These affinities are measured as a concentration. MIC means what's the uh, mean concentration? What's the concentration to have a mean inhibitory activity? So the lower the concentration, the higher the, po the affinity of the, of the ligand. So they were changing by derivative, I mean in the colorful picture, several times in the same place in order to get the optimization of the, of the lead. Okay? Well, this has, these are other three stories for um, drugs against cancer. Three stories different, also looking for different steps, combining experimental results, crystallography, and computer-aided design. So this was the lead compound. This is the one that has a name uh, on the shelf as a medicine with uh, several steps. And you can see, if, you, uh, if I see, I'm a chemist, if I see these two molecules, I, with difficulty, I uh, will have difficulty to know that they are related in some form. The relationship is just that both are active and this is better. Okay? Well, the, um, I will skip this. Well, these are very uh, a set of different uh, uh, programs for doing docking. The important part here is that if you see this column, all of them are designed for protein, small ligand docking. Very similar to the example I give you the first time. I will uh, pass to the next slide and please see that these letters will change to protein-protein contacts and also to protein-protein and protein small molecule. And this means the type of algorithms inside, but also the, sc the scoring functions that they use. One more uh, slide, it's the continuation of a long table. 
And here we have protein, protein, protein DNA, protein RNA, and protein small molecule, and so on. So the receptor and the ligand may not be the typical ones that I show you, a small one with a protein, but an active molecule with another active molecule, which complex will change the function and may function as a, pharma a pharmaceutical agent, right? So it's much more than I show you, but let's see the scoring functions. I choose uh, five of them, and I want uh, you to see first that, I, that they are very de reductionist. They separate hydrogen bonding, metal ligand, and Van der Waals contacts, as if they were separate phenomena, but they are all related and they are just uh, polarizations of a common or a, of, of a continuum of atom-atom interactions. Also, the zooms are also reductionist, because when you have a ligand inside a receptor, you test the atom one of the ligand with atom one of the receptor, and that's one of these values. Then one with two, one with three, one with four, okay, you're learning uh, docking. <laughs> and so on, and then atom down, uh, two with all of them, and so on, but they are all summed together. So it doesn't matter which atom is next to me in order to calculate the interaction with the receptor. So they are reductionist in, in several ways. Um, and also you have a function, a form, a mathematical form for distance and the geometry of these contacts, parameters for certain types of atoms, but also a weight that was adjusted with a set of known uh, atoms. So Nina is, is there? Well, the question uh, was about the possibility of having this score like a real uh, free energy value, and it's not, because it was calibrated in order to get well, res uh, get uh, good results, but with a set of compounds. So they are devoted to certain type of receptor and certain type of compounds. And uh, also you have hydrogen bonding. Look that you may have lots of different phenomena, but it's very difficult to have uh, three bonds uh, or three atom contacts here. Most of them are pair, atom pairs. Well, now remember this part. Now let's see some uh, of the advances in uh, artificial um, uh, intelligence. And remember that docking was here, but there is a lot of steps, right? Have you seen uh, here about phase one, phase two, and phase three on clinical trials on humans? These are unhealthy humans, just to see if they don't die with the medicine. Well, with, with good protocols, but if it is not toxic for, hum for healthy humans. Here you see if it works for sick people to get well. And here you test in a lot of conditions of uh, combination of uh, diseases with different conditions zoomed in every patient and with different uh, uh, types of humans. I mean, with different uh, genomes. Well, now, if we remember this line together, let's see the next one, where uh, artificial intelligence can be used in several things, and we will see the research and discovery of drugs. But it can be used, they say, in uh, every single activity in health. Okay, we will do a magnification of this figure in the next two slides, but now I want to see the general form of, of the picture. Here you have the input for artificial intelligence. Here you have the computational software and hardware that gets that information. And this is the path of drug discovery, starting for lead identification and ending in, clini in clinical uh, development. And what you see here 
are the different tools in artificial intelligence that can be used in the drug uh, design process. So in every single step of the path. And uh, that was amazing for me when I saw it and that's why I want to share you. So let's see the first part and then the, the lower part, okay? In the first part, we have the biology, uh, biological information and also theoretical. We can, uh, something that uh, makes me very excited is to think about the chemical space. Chemical space is the set of all possible molecules that are stable. And the number of that is infinite. So there are a large amount of molecules that we can test and we will have always more molecules to test than live uh, computer resources and generations, okay? So with an infinite chemical space, there will be always potential molecules to serve in health or in any, any applications. The problem is looking for that. So we can construct large uh, uh, sets of molecules with different type of characteristics and put it as input to the software of artificial intelligence. Also, we have a lot of genomes, human and also animal, because some drugs are made for veterinary purposes. Um, and all this information is stored and is the input for the, uh, for the software to process it and to propose with a particular purpose. And then these times are uh, reduced, uh, they say, because of the search with this type of methodology using different types of uh, uh, machine learning uh, programs and different uh, requests of the user of the, of the software. This is a very nice uh, article. Uh, it's the Gupta one. Uh, I will show you at the end. Well, now, does these uh, modern techniques have uh, improved our way, our capacity of making new drugs? Well, this is uh, from the FDI report. Uh, the numbers are the new drugs that were approved each year in the last uh, 10 years. And it's about 43, the average. So 43 new medicines, new drugs that are approved every year. And many of them on neglect, neglected or of orphaned uh, diseases, those that uh, are found in small parts of uh, population. Okay. Can you see a... Uh, something like a growing trend? It's very difficult to say so, but if so, it's not very big. So maybe we have to wait two years more if they invite me to the, to the next uh, <laughs> the office uh, conference, and, and we will see what happens in the next two years, okay? Well, these, these are in 2021 and in 2022, the percentage of compounds that are not modifications of, new, of uh, previous drugs, but drugs that have a completely new mechanism of therapeutic uh, activity. Is it clear? Because some of the new drugs are modifications of, uh, for fighting against the resistance of antibiotics, for example, but they work the same, but uh, they are effective on the resistant uh, varieties of, of, of the cells. But 54% of the new drugs were completely new in, the, in their mechanism of action. And these are about 50% also, the orphan, uh, the orphan uh, uh, diseases. Okay, now I, I want to end uh, this talk. Uh, very quickly, 
showing uh, two results of the works where I have collaborated with the docking. One of them is in protein protein docking. Look at the title. <laughs> it's very complex, but it means the following. One people at Imagen had a, prob a cardiac problem. He was uh, sequenced his uh, genome, and they found two uh, different mutations. One of them changes a positive residue, arginine, for an ne electrically neutral one, cysteine, and it's here. And the other is a mutation that puts a stop in the middle of a protein, so a whole domain disappears in that people. Remember that we have two alleles, and these were homozygotous. That means that the mutation was in only one of the copies of the genome. And uh, you may have, or that person may have the healthy, healthy, healthy mutant in both ways, and the double mutant in if they were expressed the same in 25, 50, and 25%. Uh, we don't know what's the rate of expression, but uh, uh, you can have uh, those different ones. Uh, we made the model, the docking and the energy interactions, and we found that uh, this homodimer uh, is uh, loose by, by the mutation, but also the second mutation deals with another protein that binds to this one. So that was the relation of the double mutant. And uh, these points are the center of mass of this protein docked on the mutant, on the single mutant dimer. So we can see that they cannot bind the same in both sides. By the way, this, this paper was approved uh, last week. Uh, also, these, uh, these proteins are from the nucleus of leukocytes, of white cells, and this is the changes in form by one of the mutations, the other mutation, and the double one. And surprisingly, the double one is not worse than the single ones, but the disease is. That is uh, somewhat interesting. It seems to morphologi uh, formal, morphologically uh, compensate, but not functional. Well, anyway, the importance of this thing is that this is the patient. These are his parents, but these are his sons. And the uh, uh, black uh, parts means one of the mutants. Gray is the other one. So this guy should have a cardiologist very frequent. That's important of this type of predictions. And uh, I, I will end very quickly with another type of docking. Sometimes, uh, most of the times, docking means put something to interfere with the binding of a substrate, like the, my first example. In this case, we have two proteins that they get along, and one of them takes one to the uh, inner part of the membrane and we design some molecules to avoid the um, liberation of that complex, like a molecular staple, to have it together. They, were, they are involved in cancer. We, have, we found an enriched set of 34 compounds, uh, and we found three of them that were very good against cancer tumors. They make contacts with both molecules and apparently they put it together and avoid the subsequent steps. The contacts uh, are so on, uh, the interactions, etc. Et and uh, some experiments show if the cells die or they go to apoptosis, to a programmated death, or, or, or they just explode. But the importance here is that when a tumor is translated, uh, is put on a mice and is treated with these compounds, the tumor reduces with time 
this is the size of the tumor of a rat without uh, the, the compound, and this is with uh, the compound, one of the compounds at different uh, concentrations. And this is the weight of the mice, trying to show that it's not so toxic. If it is to toxic, the weight uh, goes down. Well, the important thing is that in experimental results, one of them was good in colorectal cancer cells, and the other one was for pancreas. And, uh, but now in, uh, in the step of uh, non-human animals tests. Okay. Thank you. These are the, the reference if you want to take it. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we have time for a very quick question. Yes. In the slide about the artificial intelligence methods, there was something called reverse docking. What is that? Reverse? Reverse docking. Oh. You have a compound and you look for which receptors will be uh, fit and you can predict for a molecule uh, what is the disease that he can cure. Oh, well, what is the receptor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So I, we have a present for Professor oh, thank you. Arturo. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on for the, our next speaker. Is Alejandro around? Ah, Jose Antonio, sorry. <laughs> Jose Antonio Vélez is in our next speaker. He will talk about physical features of polymer translocation across a cylindrical channel. Yes, of course. Just a brief announcement. Please, um, at the end of uh, Jose Antonio's talk, please join us to the general group photograph of the event, which is going to be outside, right, Jorge? In the, outside the building, just to take the scenery of this fantastic building. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, today, I'm going to show you some theoretical results of the free energy of one polymer crossing a cylindrical channel. And also, the time needed for the polymer to cross such an energy barrier. Translocation is the process in which a polymer is transported from one region to another, crossing a molecular, a molecular channel. Inside cells, there exist several channels, and these channels uh, can be diverse in geometry. For instance, the bacterial injectisome is a molecular channel that resembles a needle. Uh, this needle has a radius of two nanometers, 
and the length of the channel can be between 20 and 100 nanometers. Inside cells, several proteins are transported across these channels. Uh, most of the proteins have to cross in an unfolded conformation. So, uh, it is pretty interesting to understand how translocation occurs uh, due to its potential applications. For instance, uh, there, there are some experiments that separate polymers according to its size. Uh, by measuring the current, the current blockade, when one polymer crosses the channel. How can I point? When one, poly when one polymer is crossing the channel, um, it generates a, an ionic current blockade, and the duration of the blockade, the duration of the blockade can be related to the size of the polymer that is crossing. Um, it also, well, one of its potential applications is in, sequencings, in sequencing of biopolymers. For instance, uh, when the polymer is crossing the channel, the, mon well, the way it crosses the channel generates a specific current blockade pattern, and that pattern can be related to the monomers that are blocking, that are blocking the channel at that moment. So it is interesting to understand how translocation proceeds uh, due to its potential applications. Uh, we, we have been working on a very simplified model to understand polymer translocation. Uh, inside cells, proteins have to, cross, have to cross a channel in an unfolded conformation. So we assume that one protein can be treated as a polymer that has no restriction on its conformations as the polymer crosses a solid channel. Uh, we will assume that there is not any restriction on the polymer conformations. So we will assume that this polymer is an ideal, an ideal, an, an ideal chain. Awesome. Well, one polymer consists of n of n monomers. And each monomer is specified by its position vector. So one conformation of the polymer is defined by the set of all, poly of, of all, monomer, of all monomer positions. And if somehow we know the potential energy of the polymer uh, for one specific conformation, and if we know all possible conformations, we can compute the distribution function of the polymer. So the distribution, the distribution function goes as the exponential of the potential energy. So uh, one conformation gives one specific, one specific energy of the polymer. So if somehow we, we know the whole set of polymer conformations, we can compute the distribution function. And from that function, we can compute the partition function. So uh, this distribution function can be written in terms of the of the vectors of the end of the position vectors of the polymer ends. Uh, this this distribution function uh, can be written in terms of the of one of the of one of the position vectors of the polymer and and one of the other oh, sorry um, well. 
if, if, if somehow we, we compute this distribution function, we integrate over all possible positions of the, of the ends of the, of the polymer, and from that integral, the free energy of the polymer uh, can be computed. For simplicity, we will assume that the polymer has no restriction on its conformations. In that case, the distribution function is a Gaussian function. And that distribution function obeys a diffusion equation. So if we solve this diffusion equation, we can compute the partition function for the polymer in translocation, when the polymer is crossing one specific channel. We will study the transport of a polymer crossing a cylindrical channel. So in that case, we need to solve the diffusion equation uh, in several regions. When the polymer is in one donor region, when the polymer is inside the cylindrical channel, and when the polymer is uh, crossing the channel and arriving at the receptor region. So we have to solve the diffusion equation in order to compute the distribution function. And from that function, we compute the partition function and then the free energy. So first, we solve the diffusion equation when one polymer is in the donor, sorry, in the donor region. In that case, the, the distribution function is this expression. When the polymer enters the cylindrical channel, one of its end has to be located at the entrance. The other polymer end can be anywhere in the half space region. So from, from the solution of the diffusion equation, we integrate that function uh, when one of the polymer ends free and the other located at the entrance. And then we have the partition function of the polymer when it's entering the channel. This partition function depends on the number of monomers and on the radius of the entrance. So now, we solve the diffusion equation when the polymer is inside the cylinder the, inside the cylindrical channel. So in this case, the distribution function is written in cylindrical polar coordinates. Uh, when the polymer is inside the cylindrical channel, the distribution function depends on the length of the channel, depends on its radius, and also in the number of monomers of the polymer. Entropy will be against the polymer going into the channel. You, are you considering the entropy there? Well, in fact, this model only considers entropy. Well, these calculations are based on the conformations of the whole chain. So this, these calculations only uh, consider entropy. We are not considering any uh, external potential um, from the channel with the, with the chain or between the monomers itself. Because the partition function is based on the distribution function of conformations. If the, the polymer is completely free, it has a larger space of possible configurations outside the channel than inside the channel, right? Yes. That's right. Hence, the entropy, which is the log of that number, 
is greater outside than inside. Yes, so that's correct. So the, the maximization of entropy implies that the polymer would be better outside than inside. So what's the force making the polymer going into the channel? In the following, we will consider a chemical potential inside the channel. Ah. So, so you, you have some force to overcome entropy. Be because you have more ways to have the free polymer outside the channel than inside, right? So there are more configurations. It's more likely to be outside than inside. So you have to break that barrier, this uh, configuration entropy barrier, in order for for the polymer to get into the channel and flow through the channel, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so, so that, that's what uh, Jaime was saying, I guess. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, actually, you can think of the problem um, uh, in terms of Brownian motion, and you take uh, one of the ends of the polymer as the initial uh, mo Brownian motion of the particle, and so you want to compute what is the probability that the other ending of the polymer is inside of the cylinder. And actually, you can also compute uh, how, uh, what is the probability uh, in the other, in the receptor uh, side, no? So you don't need actually a force. Uh, so you, you have to compute just this uh, green function, uh, which is the probability. So th th there's going to be a probability. Maybe it's small, but uh, there's going to be a probability that a conformation will cross the, the region. Uh, in order to achieve translocation, we are assuming that the, that the process can occur by diffusion. So I know that it's very hard to believe, uh, but in our calculations, we consider a rate, a constant rate that drives the monomers inside the channel. And also, we incorporate a chemical potential that facilitates the insertion of the polymer inside the channel. And, and also, I'm going to show you which is the energy barrier only by entropy. So in order to know the free energy, first we need to solve the diffusion equation. Once we solve the diffusion equation, we have to compute the partition function. So we have solved the diffusion equation when the polymer is inside the cylindrical channel. In translocation, we have to consider all possible conformations as the polymer moves inside the channel. So. Uh, when the polymer enters the channel, one of its end have to cross the entrance while the other can be inside the channel uh, at any position. So from that distribution function, uh, we have to integrate, uh, taking account that, uh, that situations that one end has to be here and the other can be free. And there is another situation when the leading end of the polymer reaches the exit of the channel uh, and, it, and the other end, the rear end, is at the entrance of the channel. So from the distribution function, we integrate, well, assuming that both ends are at the entrance and at the exit, and we have now the partition function for this specific conformation. Okay. Now, uh, for simplicity, we assume that there is a constant chemical potential that drives the translocation inside the channel. Uh, this, this chemical potential that is constant uh, contributes with an exponential 
factor to the partition function. So now, with these four partition functions, we construct the partition function as the polymer enters the cylindrical channel and passes through it. The potentials at the both ends of the channels are different? At the moment, they or are the same. I, I mean, you are assuming that one side of the channel is equal to the other side once they are outside, or are, different, are they different? Because if, if they are the same, the solution of, of the, your polymer on both sides is the Perkusjevic, right? And if you uh, take one l minus the other, you would get zero potential. Oh, uh, well. Outside the channel is just a hypernet, a hypernet chain moving around, right? Outside the channel, uh, there is not any chemical potential. Solution. It's only inside the channel. I can consider... No, but if, if you are at the boundary, the potential at the very boundary should be the same inside the channel and out, outside the channel, right? It's yes. The, it's a, and outside the channel, it's a Perkusjevic potential. Uh, there is not a chemical potential outside the channel. It's moving around, right? It's free to move. No. The, the distribution function should, should be Perkusjevic. Hypernetic chain, the, the, the random polymer. Right? Yeah, it's moving around. It has configurational entropy, and the configurational entropy gives rise to a configurational distribution function, and the solution has 40 years and is the Perkosjevic solution. If it is the same kind of behavior in one side of the channel and in the other, if the two outside sides of the channel are the same, the potential at the boundary, which is caused by this distribution function, is the same at both ends. If you take the difference, that should be zero. In order for, for the polymer to actually move along, you have to have one side of the channel ha with something happening and the other side of the channel with other things happening. Let's say a different chemical potential, a different concentration, a magnetic field, whatever, something different. If they are the same, you have the same potentials in both sides, right? Or am, am I missing something? I'm not considering any external potential. No, but he was solving the two boundaries, right? And at the, two, at, at the very boundary, the potential should be the same inside and, uh, and outside. That's a continuity condition. Uh, okay. Now, as the polymer moves across the channel, there exists several possible conformations. From all possible conformations, we can identify seven steps. In the first step, the polymer chain is in the donor region when the leading in, when the, with its leading end at the entrance. In the second step, P monomers enter the channel. In the third step, the leading end reaches the exit of the channel, and from, that, and from there, the polymers keeps moving, uh, and then Q monomers arrive to the receptor region. So the polymer keeps moving uh, until the whole chain arrives at the receptor region. So by using the four partition functions, we connect those partition functions and construct the partition function for each step in translocation. So, for instance, in the first step of translocation, the chain is completely in the donor region. So, the partition function for the first step is the partition function of the whole polymer in the donor region. In the second step, P monomers enter the channel. So, the partition function is 
the partition function of the monomers inside the channel uh, plus the contribution from a chemical potential of the monomers inside the channel uh, plus the partition function of the monomers that have, that have not entered the channel. So with those four partition functions, we construct the partition function for each step during translocation. So we have uh, seven steps. And from those partition functions, we compute the, fr the free energy of the whole process. These seven steps are defined by two variables and one parameter. Uh, we define three main stages of translocation. The first stage is when the polymer enters until the leading end reaches the exit. We call this first step, this first stage, the filling process. In the second stage, the polymer diffuses across the channel, keeping these numbers inside fixed. So the polymer only transits across the channel uh, until the rear end reaches the channel entrance. So this is uh, the second step, the transit of the polymer across the channel. And the last final stage is when the monomers inside a channel uh, keep moving forward until the channel is emptied. So from the seven step, we can divide three main stages. And there exist only two variables that describe these three stages. The number of monomers inside the channel without reaching the exit, and the number of monomers that arrive at the receptor region. Okay. So now, I'm going, to, I'm going to show you what you call the entropic energy barrier. Uh, I'm going to show you the barrier for a polymer of 300 monomers assuming that the, monom the, that the monomer length is 3.8 Armstrongs, the distance between two alpha carbons in proteins. And for the channel, I'm using the following parameters. I'm assuming that, ch that the channel has a length of 10 nanometers. In 10 nanometers can be accommodated 26 monomers in an extended conformation, and that the channel has one has a pore radius of one nanometer. Uh, okay. In our calculations, uh, we assume that the channel is filled with a specific number of monomers. So at the moment, I'm going to show you calculations assuming that the channel is filled with 52 monomers, uh, twice the monomers that can be accommodated in an extended conformation inside the channel. So this is the energy barrier that the polymer, that the polymer has to cross when it's crossing the cylindrical channel. In this part, well, th this part represents the process when the polymer enters the channel until the leading end reaches the channel exit. So uh, at the beginning, all the chain is in the receptor region. Uh, there is the maximum number of conformations as the polymer enters there is a reduction in conformations, and that increases the free energy. That increases the free energy until the leading end reaches the, the channel exit. So then, uh, 
there is a small reduction on the free energy. It occurs because uh, as the polymer transits across the channel, some monomers arrive at the receptor region, and now there is a gain in entropy. So that, gain on, that gain in entropy reduces the free energy. So the gain in entropy reduces the free energy until, until the rear end reaches the, the channel entrance. And from then, the number of monomers arriving at the receptor region uh, keeps increasing, and that increase maximizes the entropy, and that reduces the free energy. So when the channel is being emptied, the free energy uh, decreases. So this is the entropy barrier that you were talking about. So that's right. So now, the calculations were made assuming that the channel has a radius of one nanometer. If the radius is changed, for instance, if the radius is changed by 25%, this energy barrier uh, doubles its value. On the contrary, if the channel radius is larger, well, if the radius increases in 25%, the energy barrier decreases in almost a half. This energy barrier is assuming that the channel is filled with 52 monomers. So we are assuming that the, that the polymer crosses the channel, uh, filling the channel only with 52 monomers. But if, if inside the channel there, there are more monomers filling the channel, So if instead of filling with 52 monomers, the channel is filled with 78, then the energy barrier increases. The height of the energy barrier is increased, but also the energy barrier is enlarged. So by increasing the number of monomers inside the channel, the energy barrier is modified in two ways. So the energy barrier, uh, the height grows and the barrier is enlarged. So, in these calculations, uh, we didn't consider a chemical potential. So this is the free energy. If now there is a chemical potential, For instance, a chemical potential that promotes insertion, insertion of the polymer inside the channel, then the energy barrier is decreased. On the contrary, if there is some chemical potential that opposes the insertion of the polymer inside the channel, the energy barrier is increased. When the polymer is crossing the channel, the number of monomers that are inside the channel can be any. So the time needed for the polymer to cross the channel uh, depends on the number of monomer, depends on the number of monom or monomers inside the channel. So that monomer specifies the type of energy barrier that the polymer has to cross. So <clears throat> we compute the, the transport time assuming that the process occurs by diffusion. Oh. 
of course, by, by diffusion, and also because there is a rate constant of the monomers enter, entering the channel. So the process is defined by two variables, P, the number of monomers inside the channel, Q, the number of monomers arriving at the receptor region. So these are stochastic variables. Each variable has a probability. And, and those probabilities uh, are governed by a Fokker-Planck equation. So in this, in this Fokker-Planck equation, uh, we're assuming there is a rate constant. That rate constant uh, can be interpreted as the number of monomers that are inserting into the channel. It could be by any external force. So the process is defined by two variables. Uh, the first variable is related to the filling process when some monomers are entering the channel until the leading end reaches the exit channel. And the second variable defines the process as the, as the polymer transits inside the channel and arrives at the receptor region. So we can compute the time for each process. So we have two variables. We have two specific times. So, from these probability functions, yeah. a second order differential equation can be, com can be computed for the transport time. And if we solve this, this second order differential equation, we come up with the expressions for the time needed to fill the channel and for the time needed to transit the channel and to empty the channel. So these times depend on the number of monomers that fill the channel. So as, as each time depends on the number of monomers inside the channel, we have to compute uh, all possible times, and those times are averaged with the probability of having MP monomers inside the channel. And after we average uh, each time, the complete translocation time is the sum of both times. So, uh, with those expressions, now I'm going to show you the translocation time as a function of the polymer size. So, if the polymer is small, the, the the translocation time is small. If the chain increases its polymer length, then the translocation time is increased. Okay. So this is the translocation time as a function of the polymer of the polymer length. The translocation time follows a power law. In this case, the exponent is 1.6. And this power law is assuming that the channel has a radius of 1 nanometer. If, if the channel is reduced by 50%, so the translocation time is increased in three orders of magnitude. So by changing the channel radius, the translocation time, well, if, if the channel radius is decreased, the, tra the translocation time can be uh, hugely increased. Uh, the radius 
also modifies the exponent of the power law. So the exponent can run from 1.3 up to 1.8. This calculation is assuming there is not a chemical potential inside the cylinder. If there is a chemical potential that facilitates insertion of the polymer inside the channel, the translocation time can be decreased, but slightly decreased. And the decrease uh, is, most, is more important for small chains than for larger chains. There, exists, there is an interesting result of all these calculations. This plot shows the translocation time as a function of the length of the channel. So this is the translocation time assuming one chain of 300 monomers that is crossing cylindrical channels of different length. If the chain is crossing a channel of feet of 50 monomers long, the time needed to cross the channel is almost one second. But if the channel doubles its length, then the time needed is now one hour. So the translocation time as a function of the channel length grows super exponentially. So this scale is a log log scale. So as you can see, uh, this is a, an increasing monotonic function. Uh, so this is an interesting result for the translocation of proteins inside cells. So in the first in the first picture In the first picture, I'll show you the, the bacterial injectisome. And this bacterial injectisome uh, has different length. It can be between 20 and 100 nanometers. So if the channel is slightly changed, the translocation time can be abruptly changed only by the length of the channel. So in this case, the radius is one nanometer. If the radius is decreased, this is for one, from one nanometer. If it's decreased by 50%, then, there, then the effect of the channel length is even, is even more pronounced. The final calculation is the velocity of translocation. So we, we have the translocation time as a function of the polymer size. So the velocity is the polymer size divided by the translocation time. So the velocity decreases with the polymer length. And the radius of the channel also has an effect on the velocity. The smaller the radius, the smaller the velocity. The chemical potential has a similar effect on the velocity.
So in fact, it's, it's pretty similar to the radius. This is, this is a plot that I find in the literature. This is the speed of DNA translocation in a voltage driving experiment through the alpha hemolysin port. As you can see, the velocity as a function of the polymer size is a decreasing function And our theoretical calculations have a similar has have a similar pattern. So, so although our calculations are very simplified, uh, our calculations give interesting results concerning the translocation of biopolymers uh, across molecular pores. This work is, it has been done uh, in collaboration with Dr. Luis Olivares. So, mm, thank you for your attention. Yes, <clears throat> we have time. Time for questions. If in your first slide, you have a particular translocation system. I think it's translocation four, but maybe I'm wrong. Is, is that the case? Sorry, the last part. Well, that you have in the cartoon, you have a particular translocation system from a bacterium to a host, uh, eukaryotic host. Is that the, the uh, what I'm thinking is this. Some of these translocation systems are made to, to translocate toxins and I want to relate this to your slide number 22, where you have a maximum in the speed of translocation. What I'm asking is, do you think that it's possible that the size of the tube is tuned to make the translocation maximum for the specific toxin that has the size just at the, at the maximum of the translocation speed? I think there is an additional contribution that facilitates translocation because in our calculations, the translocation times increases super exponentially with the channel length. And in this case, the maximum is only for a pretty small, for a pretty small uh, polymers. Uh, yes, because it, it is uh, 30 monomers. Average proteins are around 100 to 500 monomers. So is there any other question? Yes. Just on, on the technical calculation, uh, you compute basically this uh, partition function uh, dividing the problem in three regions. And uh, my question is that at the level of the expression, the mathematical expressions, if you take the radius of the cylinder uh, too large, in principle, one should expect uh, the, the, the usual solution for the open space uh, for the polymer. Uh, do, do you get, did you get that? Sorry, once again, please. See, uh, uh, when I say in that uh, you, you are computing this green function, this G, uh, R, and R0 at the beginning. Yeah? I mean, you, you are solving the diffusion equation and computing this um, function, this partition function. So in principle, if you take the cylinder with a radius very large, you should get the partition function for the polymer in the open space. So my question is that if you uh, have checked that uh, limit, I would say, in order to see if 
the boundary connections between the different partition function is correct. I, I, I haven't checked that, but the first partition function uh, is a calculation that has been made before. What I had to do is to consider that one of the, the ends uh, is constrained to this region. So this is one of the things new in these calculations. Oh, okay. Here. Yes. Uh, the, this is the solution assuming that the polymer is inside a closed cylindrical channel. Oh, okay. No, I, I haven't checked that. Well, let's thank uh, Jose Antonio Vélez. <laughs> I'm here uh, present from the organizing committee. Thank you very much for your participation. So now we have time to take the picture, maybe five. We, then we have lunch. Thank you very much, Eduardo. So uh, our program is now we have the group picture. After that, we have lunch. Then we have the two more uh, talks, one at 4 p.m. and the other one um, at 5, I guess. And then we have the student poster session. Please don't miss that because it's going to be very interesting. And, um, and well, yes, you have another thing? We have two... Um halls to places where you can post your poster is upstairs the first floor so there's uh, places where you can hold your your poster right before six in exactly. yes before six thank you very much eduardo so please our students please uh, uh, choose your best place to put your posters thank you very much so see you around thank you <laughs>